board meeting. I'll, I'm Elise Jones and I'll be serving as your flight attendant. No. Uh, your safety is my first concern, right? Exactly. Where's the so I'm going to call the meeting to order and we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Connie, if you would take the roll. Eva Henry, Eric Hansen, Bill Holen, Here. Elise Jones, Here. David Beacom, Here. Tim Mock, Here. Chrissy Fanganello, Anthony Graves, Here. Robin Kneech, Here. Roger Partridge, Here. Gail Watson, Don Rozier, Present. Bob Pfeiffer, Here. Bob Roth, Here. Larry Vidham, Here. David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Here. Ann Justin, Here. Lynn Baca, Here. George Teal, Here. Doris Trular, Carrie Penaloza, Ron Engels, Catherine Heider, Laura Christman, Alex Brown, Gail Christie, Richard Champion, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Carl Randolph, Steve Conklin, Kara Swanson, Joe Jefferson, Here. Dan Woog, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, John Hamlin, Present. George Heath, Samantha Meering, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Paula Bovo, Saoirse Karras Graves, Here. Ron Rakowski, Present. Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Stephanie Walton, Shakti, Dana Gutwein, Jerry Bean, Phil Cernanek. Present. Jackie Malay. Here. Joan Peck. Here. Ashley Stolzman. Here. John O'Brien. Colleen Whitlow. Here. Deborah Jerome. Sean Forey. <coughs> Chris Larson. Joe Gearlock. Kyle Mullica, Jordan Sowers, John Dyack, Here. Sally Daigle, Here. Rita Dozel, Here. Adam Mikowski, Here. Herb Atchison, Here. Joyce J, Gary Sanford, Deborah Perkins Smith, Here. Bill Van Meter. So this is the uh, part of the meeting where we welcome new members. And before I want to, before I do that, um, I unfortunately um, we need to say goodbye to um, one of our members, Tom Hayden, who passed um, suddenly and tragically not so long ago. And if we might just have a moment of silence as we remember him. Thank you for that. I think um, you all have a, a memorial card here that um, I think pictures him well. I was going to see if Commissioner Mock or Mayor Hillman wanted to just say a few words. Uh, thanks, Elise. Um, Tom was uh, actually appointed to Dr. Cog at the beginning of this year, and uh, I'm sorry that you all didn't get to serve with him as long as, as, as I've had the opportunity. He was just an exceptional individual, a county commissioner, uh, served on our school board, was a fire chief uh, for Evergreen, uh, uh, businessman, cowboy poet. I mean, he was just accomplished uh, folk singer, and just really cool to be around. Uh, and. Those of us that serve in, in, in our positions in elected office, you, you understand how difficult some of the conversations can get. Uh, Tom really kept in Clear Creek the wheels on the bus. Uh, you, you never went to bed upset with Tom, <laughs> at night upset with Tom. I mean, he just wouldn't let you 
do that. He always kept the lines of, of, of communication well, and he was very passionate about Clear Creek County. Uh, and um, our, uh, our, 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 our people in, in, in our place and uh, the special place where, where we live in, in the mountains. Um, and with that, I, you know, I really do appreciate, and I know Clear Creek really appreciates you keeping uh, Tom in your thoughts and prayers and all of the outpouring support for uh, Clear Creek County at this time. Thanks. So that's a, a tough note to start a meeting on, but maybe we can keep the, the spirit of Tom with us and, and treat each other with the respect that he would have and, and with his levity that we will certainly miss. So introducing some of the new members that are joining us for a first time, I wanted to um, uh, welcome Larry Vidum from Bennett, who used to be the alternate and is now the member. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Welcome. And I understand that the new alternate from Federal Heights, John Hamlin, is with us tonight. Welcome. And then I, I would note that Doris Trular from Centennial, who used to be an alternate, is now the, the member. And Carrie's here tonight. And you're the alternate. Welcome to you. You've been here before, and we're still happy that you're here. So thank you so much. You came back. It's a wonderful thing. So I guess uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So I get to begin with the first, uh, my first uh, report as chair. Um, and I just want to take a moment to say what an honor it is to chair Dr. Cog. Um, I used to sit in the audience before I became a commissioner. Um, so I knew Dr. Cog for, for <laughs> 15 years. Um, and I've always uh, been a huge fan of regional collaboration and the role that Dr. Cog plays in that. So I, I think this is an important space that we inhabit, and I really I consider it an honor to be a part of the leadership. I will do my best to end meetings on time. Tonight's at full agenda will challenge me in that re regard, but I'll do what I can um, and, and try to run the meetings as efficiently and fairly as possible. I'm certainly open to any feedback on uh, my leadership as we go along. So. Ideally not during the meeting, but um, <laughs> always open to improving. Um, so uh, I would also say um, that Jackie's shoes will not be easy to fill, uh, not just because she wears high heels and I don't. <laughs> um, so, um, I, no, I really, I, I want to take a moment to thank you. I had no idea how much time it took to be a board officer, let alone a chair. RTC, admin, governance committee, you name it. Um, you have put in more hours than anybody knows. You've done it with a smile on your face, with that great Douglas County humor, <laughs> albeit slightly more tasteful than uh, Chairman Hilbert. Uh, <laughs> and you can tell him I said that. So, and funny. And you had the booby prize of actually serving longer than a year as chair. Uh, she got to, because uh, of uh, resignations, got to serve an extra six, seven months. But who, oh, who's counting? So uh, in addition to the cake that I thought we should all eat in celebration, I also got you something a little bit stiffer that really is more appropriate. A, a little mole told me Cabernet is your, your favorite. So. Yes. That's right. After the meeting, you're treating, right? Okay. So now, so thank you, Jackie. And now moving on to the actual business of the evening. Um, I'm also supposed to report on the Regional Transportation Committee, which um, met this week and unanimously passed both the 2015 Cycle 2 amendments to the 2040 fiscally constrained RTP and the TIP amendments, both of which we will be considering tonight. And they also got um, updates on the TIP white paper and uh, the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and our federal certification review. Pretty uneventful meeting. Um, for the report on the structure and governance group, I will with great delight say that the governance committee held its final meeting 
and is gone. I would like to ask all of the hard-serving Governance Committee members to please stand so we could applaud their service. Awesome. I think I can say with certainty we had no idea what we were getting into when we volunteered or that it would go on for 18 months. Um, but we're proud of our work and the culmination of our work will be discussed and hopefully decided upon and dare I say hopefully approved uh, later in the agenda. So, right, if you think we're going to go back and meet again, you think, think again. But actually, if it's the uh, board's pleasure and, and uh, you agree to the new committee structure, then the performance and engagement committee uh, heretofore will get any items that you would have um, sent to the governance committee. So we'll keep the spirit of that committee alive, but um, through that new committee if you do approve it. So that's good news. And um, next on the agenda, um, it is that time of year where we uh, reappoint members and alternates to two important bodies. One is the State Transportation Advisory Committee, also known as STAC. I am currently the member and Jackie is the alternate. I understand that with a little arm wrestling, she's willing to give up her alternate position. Um, and I understand Roger Partridge would be um, willing to serve and I would like to take the opportunity to see if anybody else um, shares that interest. Of, of stack. Okay. Um, so, do we decide to vote? So, so typical we vote. Let me see if there's anybody else. Okay. So then we have two nominations for well, for, for alternate. Um, I'm happy to continue serving as mem member unless somebody wants to do that. So I guess we'll need to vote then on the alternate. So do we want to do a show of hands or ballot? ballot. ballot. We'll do a ballot. Connie is, always Connie is always prepared. That's why she gets paid the big bucks, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay um, should we vote on this one separate from E470? Uh, sure. sure. Okay. <laughs> Seriously? No. no. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, just to clarify, this is to who will serve as Dr. Cog's alternate on stack. And uh, Roger Partridge and Bill Holland have put their names forward. I know, you can pick your teeth. Bless you. <laughs> what kind of sneeze is that? Wow. Um, yes, while uh, folks are turning their ballots in, um, let me recognize Director Partridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd just rec like to recognize uh, alternate director David Weaver. Oh. Yes, he's in the back, our resident bouncer tonight. <laughs> I'm sorry I neglected to introduce you earlier, but fast healing on the back. Okay, so just to move this along, um, the other appointment that we need to make tonight um, is representing Dr. Cog and the E-470 Authority Board. Currently, um, the honors uh, for that go to Ron Murkowski, and I believe Jim Benson was playing the alternate role, but he's no longer. He was not. Oh, yeah. Joyce Downing. Okay, but. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At any rate, we need a new alternate. I understand the mayor would love to continue serving as the member. Yes. Okay. So, uh, do we have interest from the Dr. I Cog board? I Bob Roth to be the alternate. <laughs> what? <laughs> Bob may have been drafted. Is there any other uh, nominations or shows of interest? All right. All in favor of Bob Roth serving as the alternate for E470. Are you okay? There it is. We have a transponder and we don't have to 
to pay for his mileage. <laughs> 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 wow. Okay, so um, again, we're just going to keep moving on. Connie will tally the vote on the stack representative, and we'll get back to that. In the meantime, let me turn it over to Jennifer for her report. Um, I've just got a couple of things I want to talk about. I'm going to hand it over to Jerry, and then he'll hand it back to me. Um, for those of you who tried to participate remotely in our first work session, I wholeheartedly apologize. Uh, we had some technical difficulties that we hadn't anticipated. We had tested the system several times before the meeting, and then when we actually got to the meeting, we were getting feedback and, and some other issues. Uh, we've retested it, and um, <coughs> we're still not exactly sure what caused the problem. The only thing that we were able to do to replicate the, the problem was for someone in this room to actually be dialed into the meeting on their phone. That created feedback. So I don't know why we were having the problem. We actually do this with other groups that meet in this room, so I don't know why we had that challenge, but hopefully our next meeting we'll have that resolved. So for those of you who tried to participate remotely, um, I, I sincerely apologize and we'll work to be sure that uh, we get all those kinks out before the next one. Um, I just wanted to call your attention to, to this document on the, on the table. Don't forget to mark your calendar for April 27th, 6 o'clock, out at the Weston uh, DIA for Dr. Cog's annual award program. Hoping to see all of you there. Um, we've got some great entries and um, we'll also be um, awarding your highest honor to someone here in the region for doing great things in their career. Um, uh, uh, supporting regionalism, so you don't want to miss that. And then uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Jerry, who's going to talk about my new report, which is uh, in your agenda tonight under Attachment A. Uh, you've been hearing a lot about balanced scorecard and maybe a little bit about quick score, and now this is really your first real preview of seeing what kind of reporting we're going to be doing going forward. So, Jerry, take it away. Will do. Thank you. Yes. No. It's on. There we go. Thank you. It's on. All right. Sorry about that. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is a new format from the previous reports you've seen of Jen Jennifer's, which has been, you know, basically taxed and formatted. And we are moving into um, just not just this report, but as Jennifer said about scorecard reporting, executive policies will take on this kind of a look. So you have a higher visualization of the information with the text behind it. So I think it'll be easier to read, but, and you'll have some trend data. So let me just talk about the attach, attachment A. The first section, about the first three or four pages, is really an explanation of the report format. So uh, there's some definition of terms that we have used as a group, so I'm not going to go through those, but I would ask you to go over to the page that starts um, with the speedometer. It says explanation of report format at the top, and it shows you a speedometer. Uh, the first, one of the first graphics we use, it provides a quick glance at how a component is performing. And it's the standard three-color traffic light scoring that you see in a lot of scorecard stuff, the red, yellow, green. And, of course, measure, measure data will influence that. So speedometers will show up as a quick look. Uh, when we look at bar, line graphs, or charts, that's also going to have those scored measures will have a three-color traffic light background, as long as they're scored, as we say. And depending on whether the values, uh, high values are good or low values are good, green could appear at the top or red could appear at the top, depending on what the measure is. So you'll have that color code background and you'll have some trend data over time. Data tables will show you what's within that objective. It shows the info, information on the objective or the, and or the performance measure. When you look at the next section, it says data used in calculations on the following page. That will show you the primary performance measures used under that component or an objective in this case. There will be a notes section that will follow. And you'll have something called, at one point or another, you'll see coming up on the next page is something called related items. So those are really the primary uh, graphics and tables you're going to see. 
if you go over one more page, you'll see Executive Office Scorecard, February 2016 at the top left. That is the top level look of the Executive Office Scorecard where Jennifer's, a lot of her stuff is located. So as I mentioned, you've seen the bar and line graphs, the speedometer, you've got data tables, and then the only one that I haven't uh, touched on would be the following page is the related items. Those could be documents that are important that's about that objective or measure, or it might be a strategic initiative we've linked into that particular objective. I will stop. What questions could I answer? Any questions for Jerry? I had one question. Yeah. The series color? Uh, yeah, it, that's just the term that QuickScore uses, but we can assign a specific color to the bar or line graph to show variance. If we want to put two on one and show a comparison, it allows us to change that color. So all it is, it just kind of puts the term in there. It's a, it's a wonky term, but that's all it's showing is the color of that bar. Gotcha. Last call for questions? Director Malay. Jerry, how are the um, percentages, weighted percentages assigned? Okay, uh, great. Uh, <coughs> in QuickScore, it will assign them unless we override them. So if there are four measures under an objective, they are automatically 25%. But we have to have a discussion about weighting as well. So some of this is still under construction as you get further into the scorecard. We'll change some of that weighting. And in fact, there is one that's in your, it's in this scorecard that's weighted uh, kind of low, called the collaboration assessment that comes from the board, but we influence that a little bit. So I have adjusted some weighting there. But if you have any suggestions, that would be great too. Uh, my suggestion is if the uh, performance and engagement committee is uh, enacted this mm -hmm. evening, that we actually ask them to take a deep dive into this and the weighting. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Sure. Be happy to help yep. you with That's that. That's a good idea. Great. Thank you. So I, I'm going to start on the next page then where it talks about um, increasing member value and satisfaction. As Jerry pointed out, we're, we're still in the process, but we wanted to, uh, because we are collecting data and starting to um, fill the, uh, this program up, we wanted to to get this in front of you, get you used to seeing this kind of uh, formatting for my report. So not everything, uh, not everything has, has been uh, figured out yet. Uh, but under member, uh, increasing member value and satisfaction, I wanted to point out in the notes there that um, uh, we have 19 participants now in our grant finder program. You may recall that Dr. Cog got a really good rate for this. It's about $2,000 a year to Dr. Cog for all of our members to participate in this program. We're going to be tracking not only how many jurisdictions participate in GrantFinder and actually out there using it to see if they can bring more money into their community. We're going to uh, work with their communities to be sure that we know how many grants they applied to through this program and how much money they got so that we can start to measure return on investment. Um, on the next page, uh, it talks about improving and expanding service delivery. Um, <clears throat> again, in the notes, because not everything is, is, has been figured out um, as far as um, um, performance measures and weights, um, I wanted to point out that uh, we had three workshops on our uh, Denver Regional v Visional Resources Program. Um, we had a lot of planners um, and other people who deal with data come and attend these things. Uh, I think you saw a presentation on this a few, back last winter where we talked about all this new data that we're, it's actually not new data that we're collecting, but new ways to show you uh, uh, this data and new ways to manipulate that data, ways that you and your staff can actually go out on the Dr. Cog website and access data. Uh, so we've been trying to help our member government staff understand the resources that we're now providing uh, through this uh, visual resources program. We have another uh, um, a workshop coming up next month. On the uh, next page, that um, is a reflection of the one-on-one -on -one visits that uh, I have been doing as well as staff. Flo Rotano has been meeting with a number of smaller jurisdictions and um, uh, I'm right now, you'll re maybe recall from our last uh, board meeting, I'm 
focusing on new members as well. So our goal, this is one that actually most of the information is there. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a, a target of meeting one-on-one -on -one with at least five members every month. And in the month of February, we were able to accomplish that. In January, uh, we didn't meet that goal. Or in December, actually, those are times, December in particular is hard to find time in people's schedules. And <coughs> January, everyone's just sort of catching up. So, uh, but we think that we can meet that. If you do the math, uh, that five a month is about what it takes to meet with, um, with all of our mem members at least once a month, or excuse me, once a year. Then on uh, the next uh, page, it talks about new member, uh, director, and alternate onboarding. We held a, uh, an orientation session a couple or three weeks ago. We had eight uh, attendees at that. Uh, we had four board members and four board alternates uh, that were attended, attending, and we also had two other uh, individuals that just came and sat in. I guess while I'm talking about that too, I'll mention that um, <coughs> we have uh, almost under contract a company to help us really build out our onboarding program now that the board has approved it. You approved a, a new and expanded, much more robust program back uh, in December. So this contractor is going to be helping us do just that. I've told them that it's really important that this program be engaging, that it be memorable, that it be interactive, that people are able to take away something, uh, a lot of things actually from this uh, and get a really good understanding of what Dr. Cog is about, what the role here at Dr. Cog will be. Uh, so they'll be putting together this pre-boarding, which is a presentation to member governments prior to having a vacancy on the board, helping them understand what Dr. Cog is all about, helping people kind of understand whether or not Dr. Cog would be a good fit for them. And then there's the actual onboarding, which would be orientation in a classroom type setting, but also uh, doing uh, some mobile labs or field trips where we actually go and see some places where Dr. Cog has made investments, whether it's a congregate meal site through the AAA or whether it's a transportation project or maybe uh, uh, some other type of area. Give people a real good feel of what's going on in the region and why Dr. Cog investments are really important and how we are making generational changes here at Dr. Cog. And then there's the offboarding, which is when a member leaves and being sure that we have um, a, a third party who's completely uninterested, some of them that we would hire, to do exit interviews to get a really good feel for what members think need to be changed in order to make uh, Dr. Cog more valuable to them as members but also how do we make Dr. Cog more valuable to uh, uh, communities that we serve. And uh, let's see, so I think, I think that's it for this, this month. This will continue to get filled out. <clears throat> You'll be able to see as we, uh, depending on what happens tonight, if, we, if you do create these two new committees and we have a performance engagement committee, I think there was a lot of support just now to have that group kind of dive into this a little bit more with Jerry and myself. But each month, this will be the kind of report that you see, and you'll be able to see um, are we making headway or not in, in these various areas. So this is a way to, so that you can see visually uh, and at a glance what kind of um, uh, performance that, um, that I'm having. And you'll be able to see this, too, on a on a Dr. Cog scale. Right now, this is really things that I'm pretty focused on. But in the future, you'll be seeing this for the entire agency, including at some point, we hope, Metro Vision and what uh, uh, and the objectives that are um, in that document, too. So thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Any questions about any of that? I neglected to um, make a couple more member announcements during my uh, report. One is that. Had Kathy Noon um, shown up to this meeting, she would have been honored for five years of service. Um, she decided to, to pass the baton off a meeting earlier um, and avoid the limelight. But um, I, I emailed her and thanked her for her service, but we should do that again. And I'd also note it's John O'Brien's last meeting from Lions. So maybe a round of applause for both of them. <clears throat> Uh, 
All right, we're well, moving on to public comment. And this is the opportunity for anyone in the audience to come speak to us for three minutes <laughs> on a topic for which we have not had a public hearing already on. Do we have any takers? Seeing none, we will move on then to our consent agenda. I would consider a motion. We have a motion, a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Our consent agenda is adopted. So moving on to the action agenda, uh, we'll begin with the discussion of the 2015 Cycle 2 amendments to the uh, 2040 RTP. <coughs> I think we're hearing from Jacob on this one. I think the RTC adopted this in about mm, 120 seconds, so we'll see how we do. <laughs> well, <laughs> my presentation will be longer than that, but not much longer. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, Jacob Rieger, uh, Dr. Cog Transportation Planning staff. So yes, I want to go through the uh, latest amendments to our fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. Um, as I do so, both as uh, sort of a reminder for most of us and maybe some information for new members, is kind of talk about how we do amendments. This is something that we at least solicit amendments uh, twice a year. So this is kind of an ongoing thing that some of you have seen before and some of you haven't. So just some quick background. First and foremost, our 2040 regional transportation plan identifies future fiscally constrained roadway and transit system. What that means in plain English is that we identify what we think that we can pay for, that we can fund through 2040 based on the revenues, um, you know, local, state, federal revenues that we anticipate to be available uh, through 2040. We include capacity projects identified for completion in what are known as staging periods through 2040. Uh, referring to air quality conformity. That's another federal requirement that says we need to individually list and show these big ticket capacity projects or so major roadway widenings, interchanges, uh, fast tracks, other rapid transit. We actually have to show those projects and we have to show not so much their year of opening, a specific year, but more, you know, 10 year, five year staging period for air quality conformity purposes. Uh, which I'll get to as, as we go through the presentation. So that's another federal requirement. So when I talk about amendments to the plan, um, that can mean a couple things. It can either be, say, a new project that a local government uh, says, you know, we can fund this project, we want to, you know, get it included in the plan. Uh, you'll see those in the amendments to match, you know, capital improvements program. Uh, could be a major change such as a scope or changing that staging period that I just referred to for a project that's already in the plan. So this is a map, and this is, in, uh, this is in your packet in this item. This is a map that's showing um, the current 2040 fiscally constrained roadway capacity project. So this is what's been adopted. We adopted the plan, uh, the 2040 plan, uh, in February of 2015. So this is our current plan. A lot of colors on this map, but basically it's showing uh, the type of funding, uh, type of project, whether it's just a, you know, sort of a roadway project or a managed lane project, and it's showing um, those air quality staging periods, which I said are 10-year periods, so 2015 to 2024, uh, 25 to 34, and then 2035 to 2040. Basically, the darker the color here uh, means that those projects um, competed for federal or state funding uh, versus those projects that are locally funded from, say, a municipality. Uh, to be clear, um, projects that, you know, competed for funding to get in the 2040 RTP. Uh, that doesn't mean that funding is necessarily guaranteed. What it means is that those projects are eligible to compete, to apply for and compete in the TIP when they're ready to do that in, you know, the last TIP cycle or a future TIP cycle. So being, being in the plans sort of makes you eligible um, to compete in the TIP. Um, again, also, this is our current plan, uh, 2040 fiscally constrained rapid transit projects and system. Uh, so it's primarily our fast track system. Uh, a point that we make on this map is that all of the Fast Tracks program is funded through the Fast Track sales tax. However, there are components of Fast Tracks that may be built beyond 2040 because we have the federal requirement to show what we can pay for, what the region can fund through 2040. This map shows those components of Fast Tracks that uh, RTD has told us uh, will be funded and, and constructed uh, by 2040. So again, this is the current plan, both the roadways uh, and transit. 
Um, this is, uh, again, also in your packet, this table, this is the list of, of, of amendments that we received in this cycle. I mentioned that we do, uh, we solicit uh, amendments to the plan twice a year. To process amendments takes about six months, so basically we finish one cycle, start a new cycle. Um, so this is the cycle that we call 2015 Cycle 2, the second cycle uh, of 2015. Um, I won't go through these amendments individually except to point out that, again, we have kind of all different kinds of amendments. Uh, we have projects that are already in the plan for which there's a scope change uh, to the projects such as I-70 or staging period change such as C-470. We have some locally funded projects in here um, such as McIntyre uh, Road in uh, McIntyre Street, excuse me, in Jefferson County. Again, that's an example of a locally funded project where the municipality said this isn't our capital improvements program, so we want to, you know, have that match in the uh, fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. Um, this is a map of the location of those amendments. Um, you know, maybe one thing to point out here just as one example, one of the amendments, if you see the blue dot, let me try and get to it with the mouse pointer. Here at Penny and Tower, one of the amendments is to construct what's been called the missing ramp uh, from, um, from southbound tower onto westbound Pena, if I think if I've said that correctly. So those of you that kind of park out there and have wanted to kind of come out and make that turn but haven't been able to, um, you know, I think this is an amendment that I think we can all relate to on an individual <laughs> level. Um, so again, these are the locations of the amendments in this cycle. What we'll do is we'll, you know, once these amendments are approved, sort of merge this map with uh, the roadway map here and then it's our plan as amended. So those amendments will then be reflected in this map going forward. All right, so again, as part of the process of, um, of uh, doing these amendments and processing these amendments, public input is a very important component to that process. Every cycle that we have amendments, we have a 30-day uh, public comment period. Uh, we do several means of notification that you see listed here, things like website, email, social media. Uh, so we have that formal 30-day public comment period. We also encourage uh, public comment at our committee meetings, of course, so people can come and, and make comments there as well. That 30-day formal uh, comment period culminates in a public hearing um, at, at the board meeting, and we actually had the public hearing for these amendments at your January 20th meeting. So we kind of call that the capstone of the formal com public comment period. Uh, the summary of that public hearing and the comment received uh, is in your packet. Uh, we usually hold the public hearing a month before board action. Uh, we like to do that for you so that one month you just get the public input and we can all hear uh, what it is um, and then next month you take action. Uh, so I mentioned air quality conformity before just to explain a little more about that. Um, again a federal requirement, the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan must address ozone and other pollutants, specifically carbon monoxide and what's known as particulate matter which is dust uh, in the air, it's called PM10. Uh, proposed amendments, uh, so we take the, the amendments that we receive and we include them in our regional transportation networks. And what that means in plain English is that this is not a project-based analysis for air quality conformity. It's a air quality conformity deals with our entire network of projects that are in the plan. So it's that first map I showed you. It's into our entire plan and the roadway and transit projects in that plan. So we model these amendments uh, as part of that overall regional transportation network of roadway and transit projects. Uh, we do modeling here in-house on the transportation side, and then we have the State Air Pollution Control Division uh, do air quality conformity analysis for us. This whole process of all this modeling, public hearing, everything I've mentioned to this point uh, takes several months. Um, and then uh, we, we uh, do the modeling for those amendments uh, with APCD's help to look at whether the plan as amended, so again, it's the entire project network, roadway and transit projects as amended, uh, meets the emissions budgets that are established for each of the pollutants that I mentioned. Uh, these amendments, and this is in, again, your packet in the documentation, that the uh, plan as amended did pass the pollutant emission test for regional air quality conformity, and that's the federal requirement. So the proposed motion, because of those air quality conformity requirements, is rather lengthy. Uh, so I will read it to you, but this is the motion that we're looking for that will make us federally compliant. Uh, move to adopt a resolution approving the 2015 Cycle 2 amendments to the 2040 Fiscally Constrained Regional Transportation Plan along with the 2015 Cycle 2 amendments to the Den Denver Southern Sub Area 8-hour ozone conformity determination, so that means the piece of the air quality that deals with ozone, as well as the 2015 Cycle 2 amendments to the uh, carbon monoxide and particulate matter, so CO and PM10 
conformity determination, again, the work that deals with those two pollutants concurrently. So you're approving both the amendments and you're, and you're approving the air quality conformity findings attached to the plan as amended. So, so with that, thank you. Uh, Director Atchison had his hand up, so he goes first, and then we'll catch up with the motion. Dick, can you go back to the slide? Use the mic. Oh. Just to make sure I'm not misunderstanding. Mr. Van Meter, that yellow hatch that runs up along uh, the 36th corridor, is that a new commitment? for a completion date for 2040 for that? No, I'll actually answer for Bill. Um, I'd, rather make Bill <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather make Bill squirm. <laughs> yeah. This is a um, uh, this is a uh, map display issue that Bill won't know, so I will I will save him uh, from this particular answer. Um, it's a good question, and and so what's being referred to is this kind of dashed line along US 36. This map, in addition to showing sort of the the train component of rapid transit, shows our managed lane, and in this case, um, it's showing bus rapid transit. So that's really what this is. It's a bus rapid transit line, the Flatiron Flyer that has already opened. Okay, so that's what it's conveying not here. Not the commuter rail. It is not the commuter rail. Darn. What is the commuter rail is this little piece here to Westminster. Which, by the way, is committed to July the 25th, correct? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't change that date since your directors are out publishing it. Good. All right. All right. <laughs> then it's settled. All right. I, I had All right. That answered my question. Thank you. Director Peck. Thank you, Elise. Um, I have a question on the I-70 amendment that's in here, and I want to make, see if I'm getting this correct. When I was on my way here, CPR said that the neighborhood uh, that was objecting this I-70 new managed lanes had filed a lawsuit against CDOT. Is that correct? EPA. I, I can answer against that. The, the um, EPA, okay. Yes. Because of the uh, new rulings, the CO2 yeah, rulings? To, to be frank, that doesn't have to do with this process. That was That's my a question. separate issue. Okay. It doesn't affect this. It, it does not. The Sierra Thank Club you. filed the suit. Yeah. Right. Okay. Anybody else have questions for Jacob or whoever yelled out a motion and wants to make it? I see Director Kanich. Yeah, I think um, your memo, if you can just in <coughs> very succinctly summarize the difference between the staff's analysis and the public testimony was at the last meeting. So was it that um, the public testimony cited different data? Was it that they were unaware of certain pieces? So if you can summarize the disconnect between the testimony that folks may have heard and your conclusion about air quality conformity, that would be helpful, I think. Sure. Um, so our air quality conformity, again, is for the entire plan as amended. Right. It is not a project level conformity. Uh, the public comment that we received dealt with and again, I don't want to speak for that person, but basically it dealt with uh, the health and pollution impacts that they felt might be associated with the project at sort of that micro project neighborhood level, not at the regional plan conformity level. That's Thank the difference in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Director Shenanik. Um, I'll go back to what Jacob said before, so moved. <laughs> we have a motion, do we have a second? second. Motion and a second, further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion passes. Thank you, Jacob. Next up, we have uh, amendments to the 2016-21 Transportation Improvement Program. And I believe Todd's doing this one. Good evening. Uh, before you, we have three amendments for your consideration this evening. Uh, the first two, which are the I-25 Arapahoe Interchange Reconstruction Project, along with the Arapahoe and Yosemite Interchange Operational or Intersection Operational Improvements, are both connected and considered to be one project within the STIP. So by moving these two projects from the previous 1217 TIP into the current <laughs> 1621 TIP, it allows CDOT to move along into the construction phase of this project. In addition to moving these projects into the new TIP, CDOT is doing two things. Is one, adjusting the prior funding to what was actually spent, and two, 
adding $7.2 million of, a, of new ramp funding. The third amendment, which is the creation of a Rodex pool um, for CDOT, this new pool will add two projects and an additional $18.8 million of Transportation Com Commission contingency funds. All three of these amendments have been found to conform with the state implementation plan for air quality. And the motion before you this evening would be to approve these attached amendments to the 1621 uh, TIP. Um, we have a motion and a second before we vote. Are there any questions? Discussion? Director Rakowski. Uh, let me yield first to Commissioner Roser. Oh. Uh, since two of these projects are within my city, uh, you should know that the actual dirt throwing for the brown, groundbreaking will be next month. And I want to thank Arapahoe County, the City of Centennial, and the SpyMed uh, Metro District for uh, co contributing funds to this project. And it allowed us to get to uh, almost 30% uh, funding. So uh, thank you, those of you who were involved. Great. Director Rozier. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If we look at um, the Road X poll, and I brought this up earlier, um, with uh, to Jennifer, if you look at, you know, we talk about the the dollars available. We there's not enough dollars to do those road improvements and other improvements that we look at those multimodal improvements. Um, I'm I'm concerned about setting aside a a separate pool of funds for Road X, especially since. If you look at the FAST Act that was recently uh, passed, um, which is long-term surface transportation bill, um, there's specifically a item within the FAST Act called the Technology and Innovation Deployment Program, TIDP, which does exactly this. And the only way to do this is you have to work with your local Department of Transportation, in this case CDOT, um, to go through so if any any of us in this room wish to go through this program to implement these type of you know forward-thinking innovative type of ideas we would have to go through the MPO the MPO Dr. Cog would then have to go through um, CDOT as the conduit to get those funds so instead of doing a set aside there's already a program it exists to do exactly what they're asking for and I don't want to start competing for additional dollars when there's already this program and we individually can't apply for them, but CDOT sure the heck can. Thank you. Director Rakowski. Given the wise comments of the commissioner, uh, could I, I would move to sever the motion to keep the first two items separate from the third item since they, uh, other than the convenience of having the same motion, they have no other connection. So we have a motion on the table. Um, is that a f okay? Um, how about further discussion? Staff, does staff care to respond to the comments? I don't know. I think uh, I think Deb does. Deb. So uh, the Rodex project, the funds for that actually came from the Transportation Commission's state funds in terms of their contingency fund. They had uh, additional funds left over from their contingency fund, so it's not money that would have come to Dr. Cog, so it's not a Dr. Cog type funded project, if that makes sense. It's just that it's in, it's in within the Dr. Cog region, so CDOT wants to say this is how they would spend their money. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo that as well. I, uh, you know, it, it, it is contingency funds that the, that the Transportation Commission has at their disposal. Um, you know, in order for those projects to be done, they would have to be within our Transportation Improvement Program to be eligible, so. So just to clarify, in order for CDOT to spend that money, even if it's CDOT's own money and not Dr. Cog's, it would need to be included in the TIP. Okay, we, we had a request to sever the first two items from the second from the third, excuse me. Um, so why don't we move forward with the vote on um, items. We need to vote on severing before we actually vote. Yeah, otherwise you're both on all three of them. 
All right. So all in favor of severing? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. We were, uh, the, the items are now severed. Um, we will vote then on items one and two. All in favor of those TIP amendments? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Items one and two pass. All right, now we'll, we're back with item number three. Is there f further discussion on that? Director Rozier. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If I can ask for a clarification here, um, Todd <coughs> or, or Doug or whoever. Uh, so what we're asking for is to create a pool of funds with dollars, reserve dollars that CDOT has Dr. Cog has to do the reserve pool of funds with those dollars in order for CDOT to use those dollars. Correct. So Dr. Cog, through the TIP, needs to have those projects within the TIP for CDOT to be eligible to spend those funds. So just to clarify, there's two projects within the RODEX pool that CDOT's proposing to spend the money on? <coughs> Jennifer. I just want to be sure that everyone's clear that this is CDOT's money and they have to, because it, they have to have money, I mean, it, all their projects, just like yours, uh, have to be in the TIP. So that's what this is, is tonight, is to take their money and they're saying how they'd like to uh, invest it and in order to do that, they put, we put it in the TIP and then they incorporate the TIP into the state transportation uh, improvement plan program, excuse me. And uh, the two projects that are included in that are the I-25 managed motorway and the I-70 connected vehicles under attachment D. Director Beacom. I just have a I'm confused. Are we talking about the same money CDOT has got is the same money we're going to use to put into the TIF? It's not two funds of money. Correct. So it's not double the number. It's Right. Okay. Thank you. Further questions, comments, or I'd entertain a motion. Dr. Director Partridge. I wonder if I we can get know, a little director, more. Director, doctor, you know. <laughs> yeah, pretty close. <laughs> Pretty close. Sorry. Rita's got her hand up. Okay. Did you have your hand up? Did I? Yes. Okay. Why don't you go first and then Director Doza. Ladies first. Okay. Thank you. Rita, go ahead. I just have the question. If we don't put it in to the tip, how does CDOT spend that contingency fund? They, they can't. They can't. So even if they want to use it for something else, they'd still have to come back. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Director Partridge. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'm wondering if we get a little more explanation on RODEX. I, I certainly think we ought to have a, a, a pretty uh, robust discussion about RODEX. I do have some concerns. I like the idea, certainly in technology, but I'm thinking before we, I think we need to be a little more informed, educated on RODEX, what all's entailed, and uh, I have a few questions possibly. So is there anyone in staff can give us, or can CDOT give us a little more information on RODEX, what would be entailed? Deborah? So um, I can do one of two things. I can just give you a real brief overview, or if you would prefer during public comment to have a presentation, it's up to you. Public comment? Uh, so uh, which public comment period are we referring to? Because like we've next, already had it. Next month or something. Oh, it d d delay it. Okay. Yeah, if you want to, I mean, if you want. Why don't you go ahead and give your explanation now, and then okay. if folks want more, then we can. Go so, ahead. so Rodex is something we've actually branded. It's to take a look at future <coughs> technologies. Um, we have been working with some of the car manufacturers, Panasonic, some of the high-tech companies to look at um, are there things that we could do in terms of a operations or getting ready for vehicles of the future. And so, this is. Um, I guess it's, it's the way we talk about doing those things for the future. We talk about it as RODEX. So these two projects, one of them, the managed motorways, the way to think of it is it is like ramp metering on steroids. It's to actually um, regulate the flow more on I-25. We want to try some innovative things that they're actually doing in Australia. 
and we see it as a pilot, so it may not be permanent, but <coughs> we want to test some things that we've had people from Australia come over and show us that, that they're actually doing. So that's one thing on the managed motorways. The other one is more, <coughs> excuse me, it's a, a communications. We want to install on a thousand vehicles, and we've got some private vehicles that, such as um, the mountain carriers to the ski areas that run the I-70 corridor all the time. We want to put some equipment on their vehicles that will help us in terms of reading the weather, you know, what's the car doing, that sort of thing, so we can figure out how that information comes and transfers back to us. You know, are they slowing? So, um, so we would know how to get ready for vehicles that, that will have that in your car when you buy it in five years from now. So we know how we might be able to use it in the future. So again, that's a pilot. Um, and it's, it's just testing out how you use it, that technology in the future. Thank you. Uh, Director Roger? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you for um, the discussion here this evening. It, it answers my question. When I was going through the packet, it was not clear um, to me, and I, and I apologize for that if it was clear to others that it just stated create a new pool to fund CDOT's Road X program. I assume that that was dollars coming from program dollars that we all, Dr. Cog dollars. It was not clear to me that those were Dr. I mean those were CDOT dollars going into and being incorporated within the tip to be used for that program. So um, with that information. Um, I still want to pass along that because there's a great opportunity for CDOT to add to this program. If they're just, if this is in essence bureaucracy going through trying to follow the, yeah, um, I'm okay. I was going to say, is that a motion? <laughs> I haven't made the motion yet. Who said second? That's the level of trust we have Good. around the table. <laughs> Wow, I'd like to make a motion for, up, I'm going back up to um, approval of the new projects of the Road X pool, create a pool to fund projects in the CDOT Road X program. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, Director Pfeiffer. Um, just maybe in the future we should probably identify where the fund source is on documents. We did that within our city because it did get confusing on where we were funding and pulling it out. So in light of new directors around the table, that might be help us in the future. Excellent note for staff. Mm -hmm. Director Partridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. I certainly would like to hear some discussion on, from, from CDOT just to understand a little bit more about the, and I'm going to call it the ramp re metering. As we already have that with a red light, green light, I think it works wonderful. And, it, and maybe I don't understand it fully, but it appears that it's just a timing factor to allow traffic on. But is, my under, is it my understanding that the, the new technology would take into consideration the tra I'm going to use just I-25. It would take into consideration the traffic on I-25 and that metering would be in relation to the traffic on I-25 and the concern I have is therefore it could be backing up the ramps grader and backing up the traffic on our certainly our city and county roads. So I, I would so again it's a pilot and so I would suggest that we have someone that's actually working on the project give you a presentation so you get a, a better comfort feeling for it. There you go. And I, I'm certainly fine with that. I okay. certainly I haven't had the chance to ask that question, so I appreciate it. Thanks so okay. much. But I certainly think it's a, uh, you know go forward with supporting CDOT on this. So we have Director Mock and then Director Kanish. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. You know, the I-70 the I Mountain Corridor, the I-70 Coalition support the Road X uh, program. We've had a numerous uh, presentations, and I do think it would be beneficial for this group to get some of those presentations. Um, Director Partridge, uh, we're looking at it as, as a total management system eventually, and I believe this is one of the first rollouts in the entire country, which really sets Colorado up. Uh, as this new technology comes down the pipeline to be well ahead uh, in the game in, in, in utilizing it and taking advantages of managing the entire system so that uh, our ramps aren't backing up actually into our municipalities like, like they have in the past and that those ramps are, e are able to coordinate with the traffic on the interstate and communicate all around. Dr. K Director Kanish, sorry, everybody's a doctor tonight. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, Christy Fanganello, who's the administration's uh, primary board member when the alternate isn't here, she shared this concern as well. And I think she had some conversations with the staff about, how, it, I, I'm not opposed to having a presentation, but what we really need from CDOT and what I believe that she received was an assurance that they would be working with local jurisdictions throughout the course of the pilot on that issue of how the interaction occurs between local streets backup and, and freeway flow. And so I actually think that's a more important level. Not that we're not very important people, but I actually think it's more important that our technical staff has access to the CDOT technical staff on how communication is going to occur through the project, which might be more detailed than we can get here. So I'm fine with us getting a presentation, but I think that um, I, I don't know what process she learned about, but I think that if we can just make sure that that's communicated to everyone, here's how any communities that, that border the pilot area will be included in frequent ongoing communication, that I think will be really important. Because it, and it, it's only the I-25 corridor, so it's, it's not every member jurisdiction, but if we, you know, we can include those member jurisdictions and then the, C and the, and the Dr. Cog staff, so that the, the staff is also aware, that might be the, the way to, but it, we also, I, I, you know, learning more as, at our level is good too. Yes. I think Director Daigle, did you have your hand up? And I, I would appreciate, because I'm a new, I would really appreciate a lot more information about the whole ramp, uh, the, uh, all of it, before I make, how much money are we talking? That, and for a pilot program that I know nothing about, I'm, I don't really, I don't feel comfortable voting on it because I don't know enough about it. And it was very confusing to me. I, I get the whole moving the money. I understand that and why you would need to, but I don't know what you're going to do with the money once you get it there. So if you could maybe have some more information, can, could we possibly table it and vote on it next time once we get more information? I, as a new person, I don't have a clue what any of it is because I, I haven't had that information. And I, I don't know that, I'm sure that the other new members are probably as clueless as I am and I'm really the only one ready to say, hey, I'm, I'm dumb, I don't know what we're talking about. We appreciate your honesty. All right, we have a, a queue, and then we need to keep moving. So we have uh, Director Rakowski, Director Atchison, and then Director Dyack. Just a quick point of information. It's northbound only <laughs> on 25, starting in Ridgegate and going, I believe, to University. Broadway. Broadway. Oh, is it Broadway, Broadway. now? Broadway. Okay. 7.8 million. But it's only northbound. Director Atch Atchison. Just Kind of going back to what uh, Director Malk talked about, uh, I have seen some of the presentation on the Road X material. This whole program is also looking at an economic development for the region. Part of that is, <coughs> Deborah's all your fault, I caught yours. <laughs> Part of it is the bringing in the software and technology development to Colorado to help build this program with that is not here today, but is partly here. We have some companies that have been identified that uh, CDOT has indicated they're already in discussion with, haven't accepted their technology, but they're in talks with. But the development of the future for communications, control, and using technology to help us resolve part of our transportation problem is part of what this program is intended to start to highlight. Not necessarily it's going to resolve everything. And I think to Commissioner Rozier's uh, point, although it may have been confusing where the money was, this is already CDOT's money. We're just putting it into something that through a political process that we're required to do, but they still have to make the decision on how they're going to spend the money. And this is part of that is developing and setting us up as a region to be in the forefront of this technology, which we hope will then be able to export outside of the region as part of an economic development opportunity for all of us. Wow. Director Dyack. Uh, I think Director Atchison stole my thunder a little bit. <laughs> you kind of expounded, and I appreciate that. But I mean, ultimately, what, what this is—it's—it's it's not a funding—it's not a funding question. We are the master list of of projects and things transportation-wise. And if CDOT wants to do something, we don't fund it. They just need to get it on the list so they can consider funding it themselves. So that's what we're really talking about. And, and in terms of an, an analogy. 
you know, to me it's more of like a master plan. You know, it's just a high level type of thought process that mm -hmm. they just need to put it on the list so they can consider doing it. We're not giving them money to, to Director Rogier's uh, question. We're just putting it on, the, on our list so they can use their money to do their thing. Thank you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> now so, I can vote. Great. Are we ready to vote? Okay, we have a motion and a second. I know. I said we have a motion and we have a second. All right. I'm glad everybody's on it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right. Way to work through that. Thanks for the education on that, CDOT. And now we're moving on to the discussion of the Denver Regional Mobility and Accessibility Council. And I guess this is back to Jake. All right. Thank you. Hello once again. Um, this time I don't have a formal presentation. I just want to draw out some highlights uh, of the memo on this item. Uh, and again, for some new members, maybe a little bit of refresher of uh, how we got here and, and where we're at. So back in November, uh, the board authorized conducting due diligence to explore integrating the Denver Regional Mobility and Access Council, known as Dr. Mack, into Dr. Cog. So we've had a doctor theme tonight, and this item is gonna, just going <laughs> to pound that into the ground. So. Um, a reminder about Dr. Mack, um, it, they're an organization that focuses on information sharing, uh, education, and coordination uh, to improve mobility for older adults, individuals with disabilities and low incomes, veterans, and others. Dr. Cog helped create Dr. Mack back in 2005, and we've been a primary stakeholder since that time. The Dr. Mack board requested this due diligence of Dr. Cog, recognizing both agencies' mission and service overlap, economies of scale, and with the outcome of improving taxpayer investment and mobility to our region's most vulnerable residents, something that both Dr. Mack and Dr. Cog focus on uh, greatly. Since November, uh, Dr. Cog's staff, attorney, auditor, and insurance agent have reviewed Dr. Mack's finances, contracts, and other documents. We've also had conversations with Dr. Mack's board, with their executive director, who's with us tonight, with their uh, fiscal sponsor and their primary funder right now, which is CDOT. All of those uh, entities and, and stakeholders support uh, Dr. Mack integrating into Dr. Cog, and CDOT has also indicated that Dr. Mack's revenue contracts can be transferred <coughs> to Dr. Cog. The due diligence <coughs> indicates that integrating Dr. Mack into Dr. Cog is feasible. The integration would create meaningful opportunity to reduce duplication, stretch limited dollars farther, leverage funding sources, break down the silos that exist in these arenas, and help us do more together than we've been able to do separately over the years. Both organizations have also commissioned independent studies in recent years that support the concept of integration, of greater integration, to improve human service transportation mobility outcomes uh, for our region's residents. So the motion before you tonight is to move to adopt a resolution approving the integration of Dr. Mack into Dr. Cog. Uh, if, you, if you adopt that resolution tonight, we will proceed with Dr. Mack to move forward with the integration, which we anticipate completing before the end of this year. And with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Director Shenanig. Uh, yes, Jacob, on, on this, um, can you or Deb possibly comment, is this happening across the MPOs within Colorado, uh, that this merger is occurring so the efficiency is seen across the state uh, by each of the MACs as well? Yeah, it actually, it turns out at least the North Front Range MPO in Fort Collins and Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, the MPO in Colorado Springs, have a similar uh, sort of arrangement to what we're proposing here. And there may be others around the state and country for sure. And uh, looking for improved government efficiency and elimination of a layer, uh, I'd make the motion. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Director Partridge. Thank you, Jake. It sounds great. I always like to hear that efficiency and, and merging together. So you gave some great upsides. Jake, are there any downsides? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, this is a new and innovative arrangement. We're trying to think outside the box. We're doing something we haven't <coughs> done before. You know, when you do something like that, you know, certainly there's always that bit of uncertainty of going forward. Uh, but again, as was just asked, you know, this is a model that's not new around the country, but it is new for us. So there is a little uncertainty. Uh, but there's a lot of overlap in, in the work and the mission of both organizations, and we think this will be a really good fit. Director Pfeiffer and then Director Beacon. The, uh, in their study, the integration of their employee base 
Um, would that just be absorbed into Dr. Cog, or I don't know what their employees is. It one, two, two. They have two employees, and they would just be integrated into Dr. Cog staff. That's the starting point for conversation with them. Yes, Director Beacom. When I went back and looked at the November discussion and that, the one thing I found totally missing was any suggestion that there's any cost savings. Is there any cost savings? So what the hope is here is that because of the overlap in services and programs that by doing this integration we, we will be able to have some cost savings in terms of how those dollars are spent. Um, you know, the dollars are tight in this arena so we want to use them as efficiently as possible. So if we can reduce some of that duplication, both at the program level of some of the major things that uh, both agencies do. For example, both agencies have an information assistance call center. Our aging division has one, Dr. Mack has one. So those kinds of program level efficiencies as well as, you know, things like administrative costs and, um, you know, computers and things like that, we certainly do want to try and look for cost savings in this, yes. Okay, because in the earlier report that was talking about some seed money being used to go through and do due diligence on that, did they come up with any idea of what they thought the possible savings would be or the reduction in um, overhead? Um, so the due diligence was really sort of that fatal flaw of looking through, you know, the contracts and the audits and the financial statements and, you know, sort of making sure that this would be a good fit um, and that there wouldn't be any sort of those fatal, you know, legal or financial fatal flaws. Um, you know, clearly the conversations going forward need to talk about in sort of that inward focus organizationally how we will fit together. Um, so it's hard to put a dollar amount on that, but the idea, the concept is yes, to try and have those cost savings by reducing those duplications and using our combined resources more efficiently. Okay, and that's not trying to be um, negative, but it sounds like we're just gambling that maybe something will work out. Well, they are bringing, you know, so one of the things that we looked at in the due diligence um, was the revenue that they would bring with them. They are grant funded uh, through federal grants at CDOT currently selects and we've actually selected in the past. Uh, they, will bringing, they will be bringing that revenue with them. Okay, so there is some money. Yes, there is, absolutely. That's what I was trying to get at. Sorry, yes, absolutely, and that's one thing we made sure of with CDOT. Okay, thank you very much. So we have Director Partridge, then Director Millay. So, Jake, I always wanting to be optimistic that it's going to work. I think you've given some great information, but always looking at the downside, possibly that it wouldn't work out. Do you suspect that uh, the attorneys would draft this at it, if there was to be a separation, there would be some consideration ahead of time in a contract for an easier separation agreement so that certainly assets for each side are uh, kept in track and I'm just mentioning mentioning that ahead of time again not to be negative but be realistic and try to make it if it doesn't work out easy as possible just just a, a question and just for us to be a heads up yeah let me start an answer and our attorney is here as well so that that's a good point and that's one of the things that we looked at in the due diligence is the process of separating and moving Dr. Mack from their current fiscal sponsor over to Dr. Cog, you know, and how easy that would be and what goes into that legally and, and contractually. Um, so that was part of the due diligence to make sure we could do that. Um, does that answer your question or do you want more legal information? Okay. Director Millay. How are we going to evaluate success and what's going to be the feedback loop to this board as to whether or not it, it what the, I'm going to, I think it makes sense to absolutely try it, but I'd also like to know what the feedback loop is and whether we, we should be continuing it. Well, so again, I'll start an answer, and if the executive director wants to amplify, um, you know, we're certainly happy to come back anytime and kind of report on the progress. You know, we would need some time, obviously, to have that inward focus of organizational integration, you know, where are they going to sit, what division, you know, those sorts of things um, to sort of get our feet under us and, and put this into place. But, you know, through Jerry's work of organizational development and, and scorecard and those sorts of things, you know, we've already contemplated, um, you know, measures and targets uh, around these areas. Uh, and I think we'd be happy to, to come back at some point. It's you know, sort of like a new restaurant opening. You want to give them a chance, but right. then come back and do that review. If you want to. Okay. Follow up. Then, then uh, there will there will be metrics assigned to measure success. What's what service? The number of people being served today at what cost, and the number of people being served after the integration, and the cost associated with that. And you'll be bringing that back, correct? That okay. That's great. Thank you. Like a bad penny, he returns. Yeah. <laughs> it, it'll come through our uh, performance uh, subcommittee. 
Uh, I just want to mention. I just want to make sure it was because there, there was nothing in here that indicated that it was going to be measured and then we were going to determine if it was successful integration or not. Right. Well, we'll have information for you. I just haven't uh, been able to share this with you, but the very first scorecard I designed was for Dr. Mack. There is a complete scorecard. Right, right. We'll work on it and integrate it properly, but that scorecard was the first one designed. So, yes, we're well prepared to bring back reports and measure data. Okay. And you'll be handing out autographed copies of that? Absolutely. Later? Brian, Brian's After available. the meeting, folks. Brian's available. He charges two fifty a shot. That's $2.50. That just gets him a half a Starbucks. Thanks. All right. Good discussion. We do have a motion on the table. Are folks ready to vote? All right. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? abstentions. The motion carries. Moving right along, um, item number 12 is discussion of participation in the Urban Sustainability Accelerator Program. Doug, this is you. Well, it sure is. Good evening, everyone. I always feel weird when I see this, the title, this USA Participation. It just, it's like we're going to the Olympics. Yeah, it's just a bad acronym. I mean, don't they know that acronym's already been taken? I, mean, I, I always thought that was odd. But um, but good evening, everyone. I mean, last month, uh, the board had a discussion about participating in the Urban Sustainability Accelerator Program out of Portland State University. Um, it's a peer exchange program with the opportunity for facilitation <coughs> and uh, some technical assistance from some, some experts in the field of transportation and the like. Um, and at, at, at the last meeting, the, the, uh, the board did uh, direct staff to coordinate with, uh, U with, with uh, USA to um, uh, draft a scope of work uh, and to prepare a scope of work or, or you know, flush out the details of, of this program a little more. Bless you. Um, so uh, USA has provided for, for your consideration this evening two, two products. The first is a cover letter which, provides, uh, which addresses uh, many of the questions that the board had at the last meeting. Um, it all, they also provided a scope of work, kind of a task description, description of tasks um, also, and it highlights, um, you know, some of the milestones uh, throughout the life of the program. Um, just a quick overview of the program itself. It's a, it would be about a 12 to 14 month program, um, and USA will work with Dr. Cog and, a, and, and, the, and the Dr. Cog team. We have to establish a team of 10 members or so from uh, basically of our choosing, whether that be elected, elected officials, uh, staff, business community, advocates, we can make those determinations. Um, they would provide the facilitation, as I suggested earlier, for improvements to the transportation improvement process. Um, it also, which was very intriguing to us, uh, uh, to staff, was that it would, it would engage a core cohort of peer communities. Um, and the three that they are talking to currently are Puget Sound, which is Seattle, Wasatch Front, which is uh, Salt Lake City, and Central Line Council of Governments, which is Charlotte, Charlotte, North Carolina. So they, they, that was very appealing to staff. We feel there's, there's an opportunity to learn from each other and, um, and uh, hopefully get to the products ending that we wanted to. And the participation cost, as we talked about last time, it would be $50,000. Um, we did, for the purposes of discussion that this evening, we did try to develop some pros and cons to, to, to this program. Um, the pros, first of all, we do believe that it's, it's consistent with the expressed desire of the board to look, take a fresh look at the TIF process. As you know, last month we brought to, to you uh, the white paper that was the product of the TIF review work group and one of the recommendations which we believe this, this cohort and this uh, being part of this, this process could be really helpful is, is the one that's listed here is to create a project selection process that places more emphasis on project benefits, overall value, and return on investment. We do believe that, that could, this process could be very, very good in helping us um, get over the hump and talk more about that. Um, uh, you know, we also, and I should also say with regards to that one bullet that the TIP review work group at, at the last meeting, um, the board did direct staff to to continue the tip review work group and further explore the uh, the uh, uh, white paper recommendations. So this this process, this program, USA would really augment and supplement that, pro that 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 discussion we would have with the tip review work group. We envision that the that the USA program would work very closely with that work group and the products and uh, and uh, exploration that they do. 
Um, and like everything else, it's always nice to have a third party assistance, although we think we know everything we don't necessarily do. Um, so it's always nice to have a, some new thought process out there. Um, what we thought was unique about this program also is the customization of this, of, of this, of this assistance. It's not boilerplate, um, not ri real rigid assistance. We have the ability throughout the early stages of this program to really highlight and um, the specific areas we would like to focus in. But that would happen after discussion amongst all the Dr. Cog team members that, that would be associated with this, as well as um, you know, any feedback or anything we got from our peer, from our peer uh, MPOs as part of the, the, the cohort. And the opportunity to work with other MPOs, we talked about this. The three cons that we, we came up with um, are really kind of related to each other. The first one uh, has to do with the fact that you know, where it's not real boilerplate, not real rigid, there is some opportunity to um, I um, mean, we, you know, we had to make sure that we were, were very clear on exactly what it is we, uh, we want to accomplish with this. Um, and there, there is some difficulty with, uh, you know, predicting, um, you know, the, the staff time that would be involved in this, although we feel very comfortable that uh, it, it augments the, a, a project that we're already going to do anyway, that being the tip review work group, that it won't require that much time. And quite frankly, we feel it's important enough that um, the staff time that's required, we should be doing it anyway. And last but not least, is related to uh, recurring ongoing oversight to make sure that there's no redundancy, that we're actually getting true value for, for the uh, $50,000 that, that we may invest. So our recommendation, um, and we, we did kind of caveat this a little bit, that you know, we, we do recommend participating in the cohort um, as long as the, uh, you know, we've really made that contingent on participation of the peer, of the peer MPOs, ones that we believe are our peers, um, to make sure we get the best value of that money. Um, we just felt that was important because that's an important critical component to the whole thing. Be happy to take any questions. So I there's a, there's a couple of hands up. Oh my goodness! I'm going to start over here, Director Holland, then Director Malay, then Director Cernanic, Director Pfeiffer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had the opportunity of sitting through the briefing that uh, USA gave, uh, a very comprehensive uh, presentation, and I I'm always a uh, a <coughs> proponent of having third-party review of, of systems and projects. And I think this is a noteworthy effort. It's uh, uh, a lot less expensive than uh, other, other types of programs that become very, very expensive. So I would certainly recommend this and um, uh, would support this uh, program. Thank you. Dr Director Millay. It will come as no shock to some of you that I, I do have some reservations about Dr. Cog participating in this, and um, I, I alluded to some of them in my comments last month. Um, in, my, in the capacity of chair, I had an opportunity to, to travel all over the country meeting with um, different other COGS organizations, and what I really discovered is that we are apples, oranges, bananas, pineapples, and watermelons, and not everybody does things the same way. Uh, a number of years ago, when um, there were some questions raised in frustration with how we were doing things at this COG, one of the, the suggestions from a number of board members was to evaluate how other peer organizations were handling these same situations. And what came back loud and clear is that we're apples, oranges, bananas, pineapples, and not every, every, all of these COGS are very, very different and have different responsibilities, have different memberships, and have different organizations. A number of the, I question whether or not these, these three entities are actually our peer COGS. Um, some of them have the federal ED designation, which means they get money for economic development. They are, some of them are also distributing CDBG monies. Um, I certainly appreciate third party um, uh, review and I think that's really important and I, I, I question whether I would feel very differently about this if we were a little further along in our TIP white paper process. Um, I'm, I'm wondering why we have to make a commitment when the other entities haven't decided whether they're participating yet. Um, we don't have commitments from them. I don't, I don't personally consider them peers. The budgets range from 
just over two million to over 32 million their annual budgets associated with these other entities. The memberships um, are much much smaller uh, because the representation kind of rolls up. There, there are no other entity that has this level of uh, board member participation. A lot of it is done by counties or designees. Um, I think the decision making that goes on in those organizations is very different than the, than the decision making process that I've been here doing for the last five plus years. I think the pros that were identified by the staff could be achieved um, by us actually spending the $50,000 engaging a local consultant that's familiar with our transportation system, that knows about our history with fast tracks, that knows about the roadway capacity issues that we have, that knows what's going on with BRT, that we don't have to, um, and, and I really do question whether we can get all of this for the bargain price of $50,000 for a 12 to 14 month commitment. I think that is very unrealistic. We don't have any estimate of the staff time associated with this. I think that's very premature. I feel like we're going to go into this and it's going to be one of those mission creep things that the budget continues to grow because we're already this far in. I don't think we have, a, in my opinion, a clearly defined scope or a budget or even know who our partners at the table will be, nor do we even have something for them to really react to yet because our TAC has not worked through all of the issues associated with um, the white paper that they developed for our TIP. Um, and I, dumb questions too, so I'm assuming there's going to be travel costs. I mean, over a 12 to 14 month period, I would think travel costs would eat up a significant amount of the $50,000 budget. So again, I have a lot of questions that I appreciate staff's work to try and answer, but really, again, very uncomfortable with this and, I'm, and strongly urge my fellow board members to really think about participation at this time. I think this is something I would more favorably consider a year from now. So, Director Shernanik, then Pfeiffer, and then um, Teal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, oh, Dyack. All right. Uh, when you guys, just, you know, my side, peripheral, it's hard. This is hard, people. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, to Director Malay, uh, you didn't just allude to him last meeting. I think you uh, were pretty firm last <laughs> meeting. Yeah. Uh, just a clarification and at least an observation otherwise on this. Um, it should come as no surprise to the folks around the table that I'm biased towards taking a fresh look at our TIP process and needing to look at different ways to, to go on this. Um, but I do have some comments that you might want to react to. Um, first is with regard the the peer group, whether it's uh, the three that you had mentioned, uh, but to be pretty firm as to what our needs uh, would be re regarding the the peer group, and that w anything that we sign is uh, recognizing that uh, that's a contingency that's very important to us, uh, because we do want to take a fresh look, which means taking a look at what others are doing. Um, Next is um, within this and, and reacting somewhat to Director Malay's comments is what's important to me is the mechanics of the scoring and the prioritization process that's being used in setting system principles and then scoring to the base items and not surrogates and seeing how other folks are actually going through that and whether the decisions made by five people, 15 people, 56 people, I'm not sure that that matters to us uh, on this. And so what I'm interested in is, is how they're actually going through that prioritization process that I found uh, particularly valuable in, uh, in what we're doing. And um, something that you might want to comment on is the reason why uh, at least I understand that the, the bargain basement price uh, is there is that there actually are other funds being brought to Portland State um, and what they're actually asking for to some extent is um, a participation fee uh, not necessarily covering the full cost of the consultants and all of that and there may be some staff cost and then the last item would be to include representation from the peer groups to do possibly a quarterly session with the consultants to say we consider this worthwhile to continue 
Uh, but uh, there might be an option that says opt out if it's not working for the peer group. Uh, that's not a decision we would make necessarily individually because we always could, uh, but to, that they actually have that feedback from the peer group uh, if it's not included already in their process. Thank you. Um, I think we'll go to Director Beacom and then um, Director Teal, then Dyack, then Graves. You'll stick up your hand next time you want to speak, and we'll get you in the loop. In, in uh, anticipation of this meeting, I went through the material, and I did have a lot of the questions, and I very much would mirror what uh, Director Millay says. And with her concerns about this, I really am concerned that the um, peer groups they're trying to – sorry. <laughs> sorry, I got too far away. I'm really concerned that the peer group that they're trying to match us with is a misfit because I think we're further along in a lot of issues than a lot of other areas and I think that we'd be better off with a better matching peer group. Um, that being said, have we done any research on their previous activities because they haven't just started this program, they've been doing it and their previous price was about $30,000. Um, and to see how those people that went through this earlier thought they got the value or thought they did not get the value. Um, and I also want to mirror that I think that until everybody would buy into it, I would continue to delay it until everybody ties it together. Director Teal. Wow, I like what the new guy just said. So um, actually, and, and I need to speak in the same vein, my concern was uh, meeting with um, Mr. Liberty was um, I kept waiting to hear the methodology. I really thought I was really trying to coach him into giving me a deep dive in methodology, but just kind of because that's where my professional life comes from. And I didn't get that. And I felt like I couldn't pry it out of him with a can opener. <laughs> Pencil. There you go. So, I mean, my concern is is that there's just really nothing there. I see where they respond to us of what are we getting for our $50,000, and I'm not seeing a real answer there. So, um, for me, this is kind of like the Warren Buffett test. Warren Buffett never invested in Microsoft, right? Because he didn't understand what the heck it was. Um, I guess I'm hearing the explanations. Well, that I'm. Was the wrong decision. I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> and in any case, it might be a bad analogy, but I'll tell you, I don't understand what we're getting. And I thought Phil did a great job pointing out his concern of wanting to see the methodology, and I didn't hear it. So I, I would be uh, opposed to moving forward on this right now. Director Dyack. All right. Um, I. I took place in the discussions initially with Portland State, and um, I was I was with uh, Director Cernanic and uh, having some optimism. Um, it was brought before the uh, the board um, as a as an item, and uh, it looked pretty good. And I think the next item was the uh, tip review work group uh, and their white paper. And uh, to me, I think their their advancement and uh, where they're at in their process. Um, very targeted, very specific to what we were thinking. Um, seemed very focused, and to me, with with their momentum, I just don't want to take a step back and sort of integrate um, that process or their time and efforts into something like this. It seems like we have momentum with the tip review and with the things that we're doing here uh, structurally and strategically that uh, to me, um, I'm kind of questioning if, if at this point in time is a good time to uh, engage in other peer group or peer groups to see where we're at. I mean, I think we have such great momentum uh, with the people that we have working for us on this tip review uh, work group that um, I think we give them a chance to see what they, they have as a work product before we then go back and, and revisit other things. So, so uh, Director Graves, I believe I saw, and then Director Partridge, and then I'm going to put myself in the queue. What are you laughing? 
I don't want to have to guess if you want to talk, you know? Please, Director Graves. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to just take a couple of seconds to speak in favor of the staff recommendation. I think that many of the concerns that have been raised by Director Malay and others around the table are actually valid. But the, the core of that, that the vast majority of the concerns can be addressed by <coughs> excellent management by our team, right, of that relationship and process. And one of the things that I read in the staff packet was, if the board decides to proceed, staff will carefully manage time and resources to ensure Dr. Cox's participation is meaningful and leads to the successful implementation of outcomes. I think really we place the burden with the staff to make sure that we're getting our money's worth in this, in this project. Uh, it's been my experience coming out of the private sector that it's always beneficial to have a fresh pair of eyes, assess what's happening uh, operationally, how you're making decisions, and how you're really trying to maximize ROI. And I, I think we owe that to the, uh, the the public that we serve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Director Partridge. I, you know, I can't really tell if Bob really wants to speak, so I'm going to wait till he really wants it. So I think you're up. Very good. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, recognize Director Malay's comments. I think that is very telltelling to us because when you, we all as council people, councilmen, and uh, commissioners get around the country. When we talk to individuals, we really get to see what goes on in other communities. And that's really, we get the nuts and bolts of it. And I say that we're not the subject matter experts. We all have our own staffs, and we have Dr. Cog staff, which is what I call the subject matter experts. Those are the people we really rely on. And when we rely on our own staff, they too get around the country. They have their professional Rec their professional uh, associations too and I really rely on them so when I see what's being done with the tip process what we're going through and being that we're in that early stages I really value a lot and we live it right here there's nobody better than we and the citizens we serve to get advice and understanding from and when you really step back and look at this we didn't ask for this just this kind of came to us which is okay but if we really want to do our due diligence and we're going to think that we have to analyze something, we should put out a request for qualifications, what we are looking for, and in order a request for a proposal. And I think we have to do our due diligence in that respect. And I would say, therefore, we should be looking at any other organization that would do this same type of work if we really going to do our due diligence. And I don't see that. So I'm in the same place where I'm uncomfortable going forward with this doesn't mean it isn't a good idea, but I think we are not doing our due diligence to really put out what we are asking for. So I'm going to slip myself in, take off my chair hat, and uh, just participate for a second. Um, and then I'll see if Bob Pfeiffer wants to speak and anybody else who hasn't. Everybody gets the first crack before we get second takes on this. So I know. I can see. Um, so I, I, too, would like to speak in, in uh, support of the staff motion. I think I appreciate the robust discussion and the concerns that are raised and the exploration. I think that's great. We should be looking at this very carefully. But I do want to refresh our memories, um, and they're probably tainted by how long the Metro Vision process has been going on. But before we started Metro Vision, we all universally agreed that the TIP process that we'd gone through was one of the most painful, um, inefficient processes that we had experienced any time recently and that by God the next time we were going to do it different and w we w we all agreed regardless of whether or not we liked the outcome that the process could be improved in particular some of the the concerns that I know I had and I heard others voices we weren't sure if we were getting the best bang for our buck um, we weren't sure how we were measure, measuring the actual performance of the projects that we had approved. We weren't sure if the criteria that we would put in place actually got us the projects that we wanted. We weren't sure if we were prioritizing things that had the, the most benefit to the region. And um, we were hungry for that exploration. The TIP review group went and basically validated, yeah, we could do better on all these fronts. So. I'm excited about the opportunity to have this conversation with other um, MPOs around the country, not because they have the answers, but because they are also looking for the answers to the same questions. And I think it's very helpful to have a perspective from a different geography, different skills, different vantage points. And I think it's helpful if 
the peer groups aren't all identical in size to us, in budget to us, that maybe they've done things differently because that's where we can get some, some new ways of looking at how do we get the biggest bang for our buck, the most equitable and effective um, investment in our transportation system. So I actually see this as the logical kind of next step from the tip review um, work that was just done so well by staff and the TAC to then take that conversation to a broader level, engage with peer groups, and, and see where we can go about tackling some of these big questions that we had coming out of our tip so that the next time we do the tip, we won't have that same feeling when it's over, but we'll actually feel like, no, we're pretty sure we're making the best investments for the region. So for those reasons, I, I would support um, the staff recommendation. So I'm gonna ask Bob if he's ready to speak. I am. Then I notice Director Atchison is interested. So. I think what I'm hearing, this is what I'm concerned with, if we are the leader in the nation, is is this consultant or this, you know, <laughs> the Portland or the university, are they gaining off of us at our dime, I guess is what sticks into my head. And, and I almost think that wouldn't it be better and even maybe cheaper if we just hosted our own summit with some of these groups and we sh do brain uh, <laughs> sharing ideas and, and come to, you know, we have these summits all the time, but we've never sat down with our peer groups and just talked um, that I know of as a group. I, I almost think that that would be more beneficial than have somebody come in, fly in, talk to some of us, fly to North Carolina, do their thing, go to Seattle, go, you know, do this world win, and I don't know how, intera how much interaction we'll do. I, so I have reservation on doing this. I know it's only 50,000. I agree with everything, the pros and cons from everyone here. I just... I just think there's a better way to get the information because I do see us as the leader in the nation and I think they're interested in how we do things. Um, so therefore, I think we could just host a summit and gain the same knowledge at a cheaper <coughs> price. So, Director Atchison. There's a lot of interesting comments that have been made and I think that we all agree that we're unique. Every MPO is unique. If we were all the same, we wouldn't be talking to anybody because we'd already know everything everybody's doing. But regardless of how large or how small we are, as being in the consultant business, every consultant practice that I do, I learn something new from the people I'm working for. And then I turn around and use that for my next client. That's no different than what we're asking these people to do. To do this as an RFP, to go out and do a competition, I will promise you, you will not get it for $50,000 because that group that's going to bid on it is not coming with other funding to help do our work. So you have to look at it, too, from an economic standpoint is we may be getting a very good deal. As the pr presentation was given to us, most of that 50000 that they were proposing is actually covering <coughs> transportation costs for them to do the flying around the country you're talking about and the lodging and meals and stuff like that. So that's that I can understand. But to get an opportunity to get insight, I can only use my personal experience in something similar to this. I just spent a few days in Oakland, California a couple of weeks ago presenting to a group of panelists from around the country on a project I'm doing in Westminster. Now we have local and other consultants already on the project. And we presented our position on this and what we're doing with that project. And guess what? They found stuff we hadn't thought about. We're looking at a project that's valued somewhere close to a billion dollars being built in Jefferson County, and we're still finding new ideas. And we're already in construction. That doesn't mean we stop learning. And we learned from a couple of companies that were 10 and 15 employees. But because of the experience they had, they brought new information to the table. Yes, it's $50,000, but what if we get $100,000 worth of value out of it? What if we only get $50,000? What if we only learn some new information? It's still worth some investment to learn if we can improve. And regardless, again, whether the size of the MPO, as has been described, is large or small, they have new concepts, they have new ideas that work for them. They may be transferable to us, they may not, but we'll never know unless we ask. So I want to see if anybody who hasn't spoken yet 
would like to talk. I see Director Roth. Is there anybody else who hasn't spoken on this? And then Director Stolzman, go ahead. I would support uh, Director Pfeiffer's idea, not to say that we're the experts and that we have all of the answers, but I think that we have a very good facilitator at our disposal. I think that we have the opportunity to uh, have our own summit and bring these, even if they're the same MPOs, bring them here to our house and have Jerry help us develop a program for facilitation and learn what we can learn from each other in our own structured way, the way that we set it up, rather than relying on somebody else to set up the structure for us. Great. Director Stolzman and then Director Kanish. Thank you. I was able to attend one of the sessions uh, with the Sustainability Accelerator, and I was very impressed and thought there was a lot of merit behind what they were proposing. Uh, it intrigued me to look at it from a perspective of how can we distribute dollars in the most efficient way for our region so that the people benefit the most. And so that did really entice me. What concerns me tonight is that it seems like there's the, what I'll call, typical geographic divide in this idea. And I think we do need to evaluate the TIP process. And I think we need to choose a way to evaluate it that bridges that divide. And I don't think it should be the typical groups of people that vote together voting together on this. So I think we need to continue to think about a different solution that everyone can agree to so that the outcome can really be beneficial next time around. Director Kanish. Thanks so much. Um, really thoughtful dialogue. Um, I guess a couple uh, observations. I, I don't, I, Jerry's a wonderful facilitator and, and very good at process, but this team isn't just facilitators. They bring subject matter expertise, particularly with federal regulations and the way to navigate them and be in compliance and find creative ways that comply. And that's something that, you know, we don't, our local consultant community, I don't think has. You know, we know who they are. They're great people, but they, you know, they don't specialize in MPOs and, and, and you know, the transportation pieces that we navigate through with TIP or, you know, with the, the regional planning process. So, so I actually think that's something specific and different that that's, this team has that we could not get from our local folks or from our own staff. And I don't think we would get if we just brought the other MPOs as peers together without that national technical perspective. So that to me is the differentiator between some of the alternative proposals and this one. And I think that national technical people who specialize <laughs> have value in a way that's different. Um, so I, I also agree with, um, uh, Director Solzman, that it would be great to find um, a path. So, I mean, I, I was, as I was thinking about, I, I do feel like, you know, reading the work plan, there are some very specific, I mean, there's specific dates with specific um, goals related to those dates in terms of exploring regional, you know, sub-regional dual project selection. I mean, to me, this is, I, I'm not basing this on the cover letter, I'm basing this on the, on the, on the much more detailed, you know, proposal. But I get that some people still feel like they want a more advanced work plan. So, I mean, one option might be to say that if rather than lump sum payment, that there is a phase where there is a first phase where we commit to, and I, I think this, you know, to, to folks' concern about peers, this motion is contingent on the peers. So if there are no peers, there's no project. So I think the motion already covers those concerns that I've heard from some folks. So in addition to that, we could say that we all commit to an initial convening, which, and, and I forget you know, which stage this would be in the memo, probably the first one, which is the project definition and plan outline. And so we commit funds for the purposes of participating in that portion and, um, and, and, and be able to then determine whether or not that work plan that comes out of that is satisfactory. Now, would this group be willing to do that? I'm not sure. They're not going to go out and fundraise for us to attend one meeting. So I think we risk a lot. I would support the motion that we have on the table, but I want us to find a way to find more common ground. So if we, if we can convince them to allow us to go through that first phase and develop a more concrete work plan, that that may f help to bridge some of this divide. I just want to know realistically, though, is that going to be enough? Or, I mean, is it just that some folks just don't like the idea of it? And it wouldn't matter what the work plan is, and it wouldn't matter, 
you know, um, how, how great the partner MPOs were or weren't. That's, there's just something about it that folks are never going to get to. So, so, so I share that as a potential idea, but to say let's not go down that road if folks aren't serious about really wanting to see what's in a work plan. So, so I, I, you know, I hope that we have the support to pass the motion. It's hard to know when not every voice speaks up in the room. So maybe we need to take the, take the vote on the original motion and then if it doesn't succeed, you know, explore these alternatives further might be the best method. But thank Are you. Are you putting the motion on the table? Because it's not on the table now. Yeah, I, I, will, I will move for the adoption of the staff recommendation that participation contingent on a minimum of two peer MPOs. Second. Right. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I just want to, I, I, some people are desperate to speak again, Jackie, George, and Bob. Um, it, is there anybody who hasn't spoken yet on this matter who wants to speak? I just want to create the space for you first timers. And I also want to, I see Rita over there. And I just want to encourage us, if we, we need to wrap this up in the next five to seven minutes, it's really important, but we also have some important work to do after this. So, Director Dozel. The only question I have is why Portland State? I think there's a lot more opportunities for us to spend our money with maybe more regionally or local universities. And that's the thing that bothers me about this is along with not a very good description of what's going to happen, what the goals are and what the objectives are and what we're going to study. I mean, studying TIP is a big, big objective. So Portland State is my problem, and they came to us. We didn't seek them out as the experts. That would be the thing that would be of concern to me. Okay. Director Malay. Well, I wanted to make a motion, and that wasn't the motion I wanted to make. But <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You guys can guess. Um, I, I actually just am going to urge uh, my fellow directors to vote against the motion be because I think um, Director Dyack summed it up pr pretty well. I think we are on great momentum going through our tip right now. If we were a year ahead, I would, I would be very curious um, with more investigation. I absolutely am not comfortable with the peer groups that were suggested. I'm just not. Um, and I, am, I attended Dr. Liberty, the meetings with Dr. Liberty, and um, I asked specific questions, and I was not comfortable with the answers that I received for those specific questions. I agree that the TIP process was painful and inefficient, but I don't think entering into another process that we're not sure isn't going to be just as painful and inefficient is the solution. And, and I don't think there's a consensus in this room for real buy-in to this. And so I also agree with Director Stoltzman's comments that if we don't have buy-in and, and feel that participation in good faith by the majority of the folks in this room, um, if this most motion passes by one or two votes, I don't think that that is a good use of our resources. So. Dr Director Teal. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Actually, I was very impressed with your comments because you reminded me, Elise, that uh, I, I came in after the tip. By um, Microsoft. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and here I was saying nice things. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> but you reminded it, uh, me that, you know, I, I came in after we did the tip process and when we were going through the awarding and I was one of the disgruntled ones going, well, this kind of sucks. And, and then only to learn that you, like you said, there was people that were unsatisfied with the process. So, I mean, I think you outlined for us the importance of what we're trying to do here. And so if it's that important, I guess I'm just disappointed to see only one option being offered for us to decide on this evening. If it's really that important, why don't we, Herb, have the, the half a million dollar uh, consulting firm who we know is going to cost, cost us a half million dollars, but probably move heaven and earth to get us exactly what we're after. Um, where is the option to uh, participate in uh, a nationwide COG, <coughs> um, um, you know, a, a, a convention where we can have a work group hosted at that convention? Mm -hmm. So I guess that's that's why I would speak against the motion right now. Is I, I do recognize the importance of what we're trying to do here. I'm just kind of disappointed that this is our only option and would urge a no vote. Thank you. Director Pfeiffer, and then I think maybe we can bring this to closure. Yeah, just inject uh, some humor here. If I usually try to pick a word. I should have picked a doctor. 
tonight because we said doctor quite a bit, and Dr. Liberty was a fun one. But, <laughs> but I agree with Rita and, uh, and George on this. Um, if it is that important, you know, Portland State came to us. And it's kind of like a person walking to your door and say, hey, do you want to buy these magazines? Versus, you know, what uh, Director Partridge has said, we should put it out to an RFP. And George has also said we should solicit uh, <coughs> our uh, responses to an RFP and, and do it right. Um, I don't feel that we should move forward with an unsolicited uh, an approach from this group. Even though it's cheap or whatever, it just might not be right. So that's my thought. Any final comments? Are we ready to, to vote? Oh, wait. Sorry. Go ahead. Dana Gutwein, the alternate from Lakewood. Um, as a new person here, um, I guess I'd like to share my thoughts. I, I met with Shakti and our staff in preparation for this meeting about this proposal. Um, and we feel that uh, the fresh perspective would be very helpful also. Um, and then I also just wanted to point out that if we, if our staff and our COG is one of the greatest in the nation and they are asking to and recommending that we participate in this program, I think that it is possible or likely that we will learn um, from these other communities. I also had the opportunity to uh, meet someone from the Salt Lake um, area, uh, one of the, their new council people, and they are doing a lot of really exciting things. Um, and I think that we could learn uh, from, from other communities. Thank you. Thank you. OK, are we ready to? to vote on the motion and see where this gets us? All right. So we have a motion and a second. It's the staff um, motion that's up there on the screen. All in favor, please raise your hand. Seventeen. All opposed, please raise your hands. The, so the motion fails 17 to 18? 18 opposed, 17. Right. So the motion does not pass. Um, so. The motion did not pass. Um, okay, so any. All right, we will move on. Um, I we will Madam now, Chair. I guess, recommend, uh, is Rich yeah. going to take us through the legislative stuff? Oh, Director Graves. A point of inquiry, Madam Chair. Since we had such a lively discussion on that and the vote was so close, I do think it merits a follow-up discussion. So how are we going to manage that going forward? It sounds like... Um, if, if folks didn't feel like it would be helpful to have such a close vote or on, and that we need a greater buy-in in whatever we do. Um, one option would be to, to have the board officers noodle on that and put it on the agenda for the next meeting in terms of where we go from there. Director Malay? Unless, I'm sorry. Uh, did you, just to be respectful, I mean, we typically, uh, when the vote has been taken, the vote has been taken. So I, I do think this w is worth exploring. Except for the last time you were chairing. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. That was a different issue. But I do think this, I think there's been enough interest in not this proposal. My point was not this proposal, but in exploring other options as were discussed tonight. So I just wanted to clarify that that was what Director Graves was saying, that we're not going to bring this back up again unless it's in the context of much broader discussion of options. That's all I was saying. So Director Graves will clarify what Director Graves was speculated to have said. <laughs> Actually, the director is right, so I'm, I'm not advocating that we bring this exact issue back up. I'm just saying I'm open to other proposals. I think Director Teal actually had an excellent recommendation. You know, I'm not a diehard. I just like to see our organization move forward and bring some new insight into our process. And so I think it would be wonderful for admin to take it back or maybe even have staff investigate what an RFQ might look like, that process for our organization. Thank you. 
Okay. I see there's a couple hands up. Uh, this has got to be really short. So 30 seconds, Director Holan and then Director Dale. Well, well I, I think we should just put out, ask for a million dollars and put out a RFP for a million dollars. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, Director really, Daigle? Mine is really, really quick. Can we, as a board, direct staff to look into it and bring back more information on other uh, entities that are out there that might be willing to do this? So that's is that a possibility? Can we, can we do that and then move on? If that's a motion, I would second it. I, I motion hang, to do that. Hang on a second. I would want more guidance on, we can definitely put out an RFQ or an RFI or an RF, all kinds or of Or whatever things. RF it is. Yeah, exactly. Um, are we talking about the same $50,000? I mean, one of the reasons that this looked inviting to staff was that we could be a participant and not have to Pay a put lot time of and energy into facilitating all of this too. Yes. So I, um, that. I, I have no idea what kind of dollar amount, you know, we, we feel like fifty thousand dollars is something that we could um, we can afford. But if we were gonna put out an RF whatever, um, I, I think that you all need to provide some guidance on what you think the budget for that would be so that um, we can figure out if we also as part of this need to shift some staff around or maybe bring a new staff person in to do the coordination, et cetera. Could, could, could I just chime in? Can we just table this conversation so we can move the night on to next month and then we'll just go from there to give better direction for staff? Yes. Okay. Thank for you. me. Do you, do you mind? So uh, we'll leave it that we'll, 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 we'll discuss this with staff and come forward with some options about moving forward. Thank but you. But we'll, let's move on now. Thanks for everybody and the great discussion. We'll move to legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I believe we're at, is it uh, I, uh, item, attachment E? G. G? Um, so I have the uh, uh, status of bills that you've taken positions on previously. And maybe in the interest of time, I, I'm looking through, I think probably there's really one bill in particular that you might want to uh, have an update on. Uh, uh, that's Senate Bill 123 on page Eight, which you uh, took a position opposing last year and I think uh, a number of you have probably been in various other meetings since uh, last month and hearing about this um, but of course this is the uh, uh, transponder bill on uh, express toll lanes in particular that's the one up on US 36 and possibly others it's um, uh, on the Senate floor right now. Uh, it's had debate, but it's been pulled off. And it, uh, last I heard, it was going to be up uh, tomorrow morning, uh, but that may be different now. And if, if you want a quick update, I'd actually like to ask Jennifer Castle, our, one of our lobbyists, uh, to come up and just give you a, a quick update. I think she and, and Ed have uh, uh, the most recent information, at least as of earlier today, on that one. There. Am I on? Okay. Thank you all. My name is Jennifer Castle, one of your lobbyists. Just to give you a quick update on Senate Bill 123, as Rich mentioned, that bill is going to be calendared um, for tomorrow morning. It is in the Senate on second reading. Basically, the legislative debate so far on the bill has been a combination of folks on one side saying, why do I have to have a transponder? How do I get one? Why does it cost money? Why am I getting these bills in the mail? And then to folks on the other side that are saying, why is CDOT engaging in these binding contractual agreements with third parties, with private companies, and also why are they changing the HOV policy, specifically um, the HOV policy that will change starting January 2017 to go to HOV 3. So the Senate sponsors right now have been in negotiations with CDOT. CDOT has come up with a compromise known as the Virginia Plan that apparently they're using in Virginia. It has a couple of, of component to it. First, um, it will allow those users of the HOV lane who are 100% HOV all the time to not have to use a transponder and to not have to pay for that transponder. However, those individuals that are using the managed lane but are not HOV, they will still have to 
get a transponder and pay for it. Um, it will also require CDOT to reimburse those individuals who have already bought transponders, which is roughly, a, CDOT estimated it to be around 4,500 individuals in the state. CDOT will reimburse those individuals for that, those transponders. And then the third part of that compromise is to allow motorcycles to use the HOV lane without a transponder. And um, unfortunately, the, the, the sponsors do not think that that goes far enough, both on the Republican side and on the Democratic side. So right now, the negotiations are at a stalemate. So we're hearing that, yes, the bill will be heard tomorrow in the Senate. We're not sure exactly what to expect. CDOT has asked our help to lobby against the bill. So Ed and I will be having conversations with the Dr. Cog area legislators tomorrow. So. Uh, yes. Rick, just for the, Mayor for the rest of the board, the, um, as an example, the U.S. 36 Coalition recently met with the legislators. Specifically, one of the topics of discussion was SB 123. Part of the issue is, and, and this is one of the things that uh, Tim, your predecessor, uh, Tom, did. If this goes away, we have no way to pay the loans. We have no way to pay HPTE's contractual obligations. And we also have a federal issue in that the EIS that was developed for the US 36 has a contingent in it that is, requires an HOB. So if we take all that out, then we have the whole thing of this public-private partnership is just going to about fall apart, and CDOT does not have the funds to go back pay in this contract, nor any others. And this also affects I-25. There's been a lot of discussions back and forth at the meeting that we had on the delay of HOV3. HPTE is discussing what is the trigger that triggers that other than just a date and they have some measurements that they were sharing with some of the legislators on doing this but uh, there's not many groups around that haven't taken a position that are in transit groups that haven't taken position to oppose 123 and it just keeps swirling and it just gets more convoluted as it goes around if we lose this we've got a serious problem here in the state of how to pay for what we've already built much less how we're going to build anything further and I, I was watching Deborah's squints every time they mentioned compromise because we're not getting much in the way of compromise that's going to resolve our problem at the state level right now in this bill. I would just add um, that a, a couple of the elected officials from Boulder County are meeting with Senator Heath and Jones in the morning to see if we can't uh, get to a better place. <laughs> so we'll let you know if we're successful. <laughs> Maybe we'll find out tomorrow. And so I'd just like to add some technical information that might help in terms of the discussion of the <coughs> HOV-3. So currently, US 36 is HOV-2, um, and there is a trigger actually in the contract. So that lane has to maintain a certain level of service and reliability, or it's not being what it's supposed to be. So it's also based on maintaining a certain speed in which case that can trigger an HOV-3. Um, some earlier modeling showed that that would probably happen r roughly around 2017. So that's the date CDOT's been using, um, is that 2017 date. So either you're going if you hit that level of service issue, it'll either happen then or this later date. And then just so you know, um, and there was a lot of discussion at Transportation Commission and um, I think it's easier for people if all managed lane, all told express lanes that have HOV, if they have a similar type of standard. So if you had some that were two and some that were three, it would be confusing to people. So that's why there's consistency across the board that see, so that the other um, managed lanes are also, told express lanes are going to be HOV three because they'll be built after that date. So that's just some technical information t to tell you why. <laughs> Great. So we probably should move on, but thanks for that. Thank you. Okay. So then in the next attachment, I have f uh, four new bills for you, one transportation bill and three really basically planning-related bills. Um, and I was tempted to just ask the board 
or recommend a position of monitoring them, but I decided to basically ask for your direction and see if you want to discuss any of them uh, and suggest other positions. But if I were to make a recommendation, it would be to monitor these bills. Um, the, the first one um, is Senate or House Bill 1304. Um, Max Tyler is a prime sponsor. He's the chairman of the House Transportation Committee. And this bill would set up, as it's described here, uh, community uh, conversations to happen over the summer and fall to discuss transportation funding issues and priorities among uh, citizens and consumers and I guess whoever would show up at these conversations. And it involves stack members and so forth uh, in terms of organizing these. Um, I've heard uh, various meetings of other groups that I've been at uh, mostly are monitoring these bills even though there are a lot of people are raising concerns about um, why is this needed, uh, couldn't TLRC, the Transportation Legislation Review Committee do it, doesn't uh, a lot of this happen already, what's the fiscal note on it and so forth. Um, realistically I think since Representative Tyler is the chairman of the committee it's probably got a pretty good chance of, of passing out of the committee and out of the House, it would at best have, I think, uncertain uh, future if it got to the Senate. Um, so I'm not sure that it makes a whole lot of sense to take a position other than monitor, but I just wanted to see what the board thinks about it. Thoughts? Director Atchison? Having just been through some of these, uh, you, trying to get you to a point, Rick, we can get you an authorization. The only one out of the three that I really had any question and I'm really looking to the counties to give me some guidance and that's on SB 16 1334. Okay. It's my understanding that uh, CCI may have taken a position of support on this because it really only includes the counties in the unincorporated portion of the counties. It does not affect any of the municipalities and I think I'm correct in that. But I don't know for sure. That was your meeting on Friday, I believe. Let me see here. Um, 1334. I think I think they monitored it. Yeah. I think they took a position of monitoring it. Okay. Then, yeah. then I would recommend yeah. for the purpose of this that uh, that we move forward the position of monitor on all three of these bills. On all of them. Oh, four. four. Oh. Sorry, four. Oh. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion, Director Partridge. Yes. Uh, first of all, in 1334, the question is, being, is certainly being investigated because it's a really complicated tr topic. But what we are looking at is that we are all already able to do this. So our question was, is there some redundancy here? And we didn't quite understand why that was coming forward. Not against what it is, but it's like, it, aren't we already able to do this? So that was a question that we were looking into as a county. Mm -hmm. um, also, a comment on, since it was all put together as a uh, one one package for the four bills yes mm -hmm. on 1313 cci took a posed position on this and i'll uh, take note under staff comments if you would like to look at that when we look at a master plan a lot of us use master plans as a guiding document kind of a gold document not a regulatory document we have our zoning and subdivision resolutions as our regulatory documents that we make decisions on applications. That is the criteria that you often have to, that you base an application on. So when you look at, they talk about this being in the master plan, when you look down, it's probably about a three-fourths the way down that it says it's a condition of development proposal, Appro uh, approvals. When you have that, that's it, one of your conditions of approvals. So now that makes that a regulatory statement, a regulatory document. So that's where we had the problem with it, that it's now considered it's the master plan is regulatory because the condition of approval, not maybe one of your criteria, but it's a condition of approval that the applic applicant has to meet. So CCI took a opposed position on SB 1313. Director Rozier. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Director Partridge, for uh, bringing that up. Um, it is concerning that we have a master plan process that through Colorado Revised Statute is a, 
non-regulatory document, an advisory document um, that goes through the process for counties and that this will tie it that you have to implement those goals. The, water, the state water plan goals for the approval of development or any developments. But that state water plan we don't get to vote on. We have no control. We can make comments, but it, they're not local control specific. And I can tell you in our mountain communities for the water overlay district, there are a lot of things that we do, especially in Indian Hills, that go so far and above the state water plan that if this goes through, what they're in conflict and different things that are going on. So uh, we as the Board of County Commissioners for Jefferson County took an oppose and uh, CCI took an opposed position on this. Um, I, it's a tough one. Can I just clarify, do we think any of these are going to get out of the house? Because I appreciate the robust discussion, but I'm not sure I see that any of them are going to survive, so we may not need to spend too much time. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, I think that, that they would all have I mean, a I difficult think get, road ahead, or they the might Senate. get out of the house, but not the Senate. Yeah, that's what I meant. Director Partridge? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Another thing, it's, and, and I'm going to look to Executive Director Schaffel on this. <laughs> so if a, I believe it's a state statute that if a jurisdiction does not have a master plan and I'm going to say it's within a Dr. Cog jurisdiction jurisdiction that the Dr. Cog Metrovision plan could be used as the master plan could be, yeah. could be. so so that that now just throws in a can of worms because now we Dr. Cog will have a the the implication that we will uh, really take water in consideration as part of our MetroVision plan. And, and to clarify, um, Director Partridge, it, the jurisdiction would have to adopt MetroVision as its plan. Right. 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 Okay. So if you don't, then you're not tied to it. Right. right. Director Rozier. Thank you, Madam Chair. And if I may, could I speak um, to House Bill 161340? Um, sure. Is that? Uh, County Planning Commission exemption from approval requirements. That 1340, yes. Yeah, it's part of the motion we're considering. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is being, being brought forward um, actually by Jefferson County. And let me tell you why. Um, currently through uh, CRS, uh, counties, if you're a statutory county, um, not home rule, we're required to bring forward numerous items to the Planning Commission for review and approval. Some of those items include if a county leases space for our Department of Motor, well, let's say our, DM, our, our Motor Vehicle Department, if we lease space, we have to post that property. We have to put it in the newspaper. We have to wait 60 to 90 days for review process. Then the Planning Commission has to hear it. It'll come before the Board of County Commissioners and then we can act upon that lease. That is a huge waste of time. We also have to, pursuant to CRS, if we are replacing utilities or if a special district wants to play, replace a utility line, they technically have to go through our planning commission for approval. Um, if you, and that goes to IREA, I have 12 separate applications to pl Jeffco Planning Commission for IREA to upgrade their wires, their, their, their um, power system in the grid. They are losing 120 days in the review process to replace what's already there. Um, and what we're asking for here is a revision to Colorado Revised Statute that these standard customary practices and procedures don't have to go through the Planning Commission process. Um, it's a time saver for everybody involved. Plus, these are the ones that typically get approved anyway. It is not to bypass 
a new road, <laughs> a new building, um, a uh, cell tower right next to a school, or a gasification plant right next to a school. Sorry, that that are you still? Sorry, that's going on down in Douglas County. I just had to bring that up. Um, it's that's not the intent. The intent here are those typical um, processes that go through that were required by law to do. Um, that truly just take up space in the queue. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we need to, we have 10 minutes left. We're obviously not going to finish on time. We have four pressing action items after this. So what's the pleasure of the board on this? We have a motion to monitor on the four bills, I believe. Are you asking, is that, are we ready to vote on that? I'm sorry? Do you, you want to speak? Yeah, the motion maker, if he would consider Moving, yes, 1313 to an opposed position versus the monitor in his motion. I don't have a problem because it doesn't affect the municipalities that well, I can, can see. It's strictly a county issue. Package. And the counties are in favor of it. I'm okay with the change. And I don't know who the second was. Perhaps we could sever it and uh, deal with it separately then. Sure, sever it. Great. It's fine. Um, all in favor of severing uh, 1313 out from the rest? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, let's take the original motion, which is to monitor the other three bills. Correct. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? So you have a monitoring position on the, the those three, and then on House Bill 1313? If Oof, you want. Oppose. Further discussion? I I um, will probably abstain on this one. Um, I don't think it um, will pass the Senate, but um, we haven't taken a position on it in Boulder County, so I won't be voting. Any final discussion on this? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions, me. Several abstentions. Uh, could you, abstentions, raise your hand. Three, six, seven. We're going to have to do math here, folks. So let me take the opportunity to announce the results of um, the stack alternate vote. Roger Partridge, you get the lucky prize of spending your Friday mornings in another meeting. Congratulations. It was a close vote, but you won out. So this will definitely be in the be careful what you wish for category. <laughs> Madam Chair, just as a continuation on this. Uh, yeah. House, House Bill 1008 was signed right. into law that we took a position of support last week by the governor. Yep. And that was the uh, bus the on bus shoulder. shoulder. Bus on shoulder. Yep. Okay, so the vote on 1313 did pass. Yeah. Okay, so. Right. Just one last thing, just so you, so you know if you hadn't already heard. <laughs> in, in our world, an important event happening Friday with the March revenue forecast, which will allow the Joint Budget Committee to pick a number of how much money they have to spend, and then, if I can say this, all hell will break loose <laughs> down at the Capitol. Um, we may be in a position of actually having them having to go back and make cuts from what decisions they've made because of the, the Tabor spending cap, but um, I guess we'll find out. More to come on that. Oh, what fun. Better you than us. All right. So moving right along, um, we are now moving to changes to the nominating committee. I'm going to tap Director Atchison to cue this up. I just refresh your memory. Um, we agreed in concept to all of the governance committee's proposed changes to committees, except for the one related to membership on the nominating committee, which we um, which we um, decided to postpone until this meeting at this moment. So, Director Atchison, if you want to cue that up. Yeah, if you don't mind, Madam Chair. Uh, just as was discussed earlier, for about the last almost two years, we've been working <coughs> on the structure and governance issue. Very many people in this room, and some that are no longer here, have spent a lot of hours, days, nights, weekends, telephone calls, 
cuss, discuss, cudgel, mm. beg and plead to get to a resolution. And what is before you tonight is all the work and hours and sweat and tears that went into that. And I think it comes with a unanimous uh, recommendation of the governance group on what we are proposing tonight, which then starts a new era for Dr. Cog and how we do business and how we engage more people into the decision process, not only from the election of officers to the uh, nominating committees to the different committees, but it actually starts to let us cut down on some committees that are going on. Uh, this would have been the one last meeting of the admin committee would be coming up. Structure and governance, if this is approved tonight, will have finished their work. And again, John Dyack, myself, and a bunch of others are going to uh, think about the next shot of bourbon right after right. this all gets approved, we hope. Yep. But uh, again, to recognize all the effort that, that everybody went to to get this to a point where we believe it's acceptable, it's the right thing to do, and it's a way to move us on to be more inclusive of what we're trying to do here at Dr. Cog. So I would encourage the board to look carefully at the uh, recommendations of the staff, the motions that are pending, and would ask your support favorably for the motions that are being made after all the work that's gone into them. And uh, we're, any of us on the structure and governance group that you have questions of, we are glad to sit as a group individually or whatever to uh, hopefully convince you that the work we've done is in the right frame of mind for the future of this group. Thank you, Director Atchison, and I'll just put a, a fine point on this specific item of the nominating committee. The governance committee recommended that we keep it at a membership of six members, that um, one member would be the outgoing chair, the, for, the, the past chair. Um, there would be a seat for a Denver representative, and that there would be then um, four additional members um, one chosen by each of the new committees that you all approved last time, and then, um, why am I blanking on, one by the chair and one by the um, board. Thank you. Sorry. One by each of the committee, one by the board, one by the chair. So that adds up to six. And um, I'm going to ask Director Graves and then Director Dyack, who both pr participated in the governance committee, if they want to elaborate on um, that proposal. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, let me say to the committee a uh, heartfelt expression of appreciation. What was really great about this process is that we sat down to talk about the future of this organization. Everybody around the table, no matter what the size of jurisdiction or where geographically they are in the metro area, brought ideas to the table about how to make us better, right? We brought fresh eyes about process and, and to be a more fair, effective, and efficient organization. And so I'm very proud of the work that we've done collectively. I just wanted to thank my colleagues for, for pitching in there. Uh, speaking to this, this issue on the agenda, Madam Chair, I wanted to ask for support of this. As the, the center of the region, we have unique challenges, right, as we look at transportation infrastructure and other things, major interchanges and other things fall here in the, the center of the region that we all use as we traffic through. And we've got a lot sort of on the hook here as, as one of your, your core partners. And so we would really appreciate the ability to have a practice that we've been using for some time codified to have Denver uh, have a standing representative here on this, on this nominating committee. And so if, if there are any questions that you have of, of me, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks. Director Dyack. You know, when I volunteered for this ad hoc committee 20 years ago, <laughs> I... 22 years ago. 22. Thank you, Director Graves. Uh, I did not think I would be sitting here tonight thinking that this was the final Structure and Governance Committee. Um, the vote hasn't been taken, correct? Or correct. <laughs> but, uh, yes, uh, to Director Ashton's point, that there have been some uh, fantastic people who are not here who can be recognized. I'm going to forget a few, but Doug Tisdale, Sue Horn, Jack Hilbert, and God love Chris Nevitt. Um, he provided a lot of color and, um, and uh, <laughs> yes, cussing and discussing was correct. But uh, a lot of people went into this, uh, this, this conclusion, hopefully. Um, we, we sat around the table, and we were very collaborative, and um, from all all areas of the region, all 
sizes. Um, we, I think we all hurt each other. Uh, we all tried to, to find uh, something that we all could uh, benefit from. And uh, to Director Atchison's point, um, we're, we're doing it for the future. So the Dr. Cog that you knew before, hopefully it's not the Dr. Cog that you will know in the future. Um, you know, I remember hearing some, some things from people about Dr. Cog, and I think um, we're well on our way to, to resolving those and, and doing it very positively, and I think we're a different organization than we were about 22 years ago. <laughs> right, Director Graves? All right. So uh, just a housekeeping note, um, um, Director Rogier brought up uh, sort of a comment uh, in terms of dilution of representation. Uh, when, when we discussed it as, as a board, um, it was within the context of uh, Denver having seats and uh, the, the, the counties potentially not being able to be um, on each individual uh, committee. Um, as we talked about it, um, Denver's kind of unique because they're in city and county and um, you know, uh, a county such as Douglas has Lone Tree, has Parker, has Castle Rock, and sometimes Larkspur at the table. So, um, you know, for us, uh, we have more than enough people to, uh, to be within the, com uh, within the committees to represent our, our county, our interest, our city. And um, to me, it's about the big C. It's about communication. And if we do our job um, within, our, within our county, within our region, and we communicate with each other, I think we're going to have a positive overall benefit. So that's, I think, what the essence of, of our um, solution was, is that um, we were very comfortable with um, having Denver at, uh, at the table with a nominating committee as well. So if anybody else wants to chime in, I'm more than happy to yield. Uh, Director Cernanek. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, w one of the things to recognize when we're talking about uh, the new committee structure that was mentioned last month is uh, desire and uh, to have broader participation across the membership so the folks are more engaged. Uh, and uh, that was certainly a, a big piece. Um, what's before us tonight and what we're looking at, since we've already approved the other elements of the, of the committee structure, is taking a look at the nominating committee. And one of the things to recognize is the operating uh, title of this committee is it is not a, an appointing committee, it is a nominating committee. And that there will still need to be a vote of the board to endorse any recommendations or come up. I think the point was Director Holden is technically challenging. Ken yeah. cut his machine off. Bill got an iPad as a gift, I think. That's right. uh, I, I'll try to paraphrase what I was uh, um, trying to shout over, but. Uh, What's before us tonight, or at least the consideration in this part of what we're doing, is since we've approved the other elements of the of the committee structures last month, is the the nominating committee itself, and the operative element in this is it's a nominating committee. It is not an an, a, an appointing committee, uh, so that um, recognize that anything that that does happen here. Uh, even though very often we will endorse the results of the nominating committee, it's not necessarily automatic uh, in that. And so that um, recognize with this, this is how it's going to happen. And John addressed the dilution side. Uh, I think uh, every county other than Denver um, that's around the table, um, uh, well, Broomfield's a county, but they're a city county of 50,000 or so. Um, every other county has multiple representations when you include the cities within the counties uh, to, um, if they so choose, strategically look at uh, spreading their representation across the committees. So, thank you. So I think we're almost ready for a motion, but oops, I see Director Solzman. Move to approve the board nominating committee structural changes recommended by the Structure and Governance Group. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Director Beacom. I've got a question on page 95 of the proposal. You've got a title. Hey, you Mike. Mike. Sorry. Sorry. 
the it says uh, remote participation guideline for board work sessions and committee meetings is that restricted just to these committees or is that the work session that we're talking about that replaced the um, MVIC and the reason is is that there's supposed to be remote call in ability and participation on the uh, work session and according to this it would not be allowed unless um, certain other activities happened and if I had a council meeting or a council activity I have to come to the Dr. Cog event and not to the council so I'd like some clarification right Do you want me to clarify sure the thought is is that uh, we would want you to to show up in person if possible but if not your alternate would show up and if that can work, then we can look at a remote dial-in so that there is at least participation, you know. So that was the thought behind it. Um, but are you referring? Are you referring on the next agenda topic, or are you you're doing no, the back right of on this, this one? Topic. Okay. And my question is, does it apply to the work session that took over the MVIC? Uh, because it does. It does. Then the conflict is that. The MVIC meeting or the work session now occurs at a certain time. Travel time from some places in the state to get downtown D Denver means that you get out one meeting, you're going to be an hour and a half late to get to the MVIC meeting. And I find that very, very frustrating that I'm elected by Broomfield to participate no, in Broomfield's government yes. and appointed to act on Dr. Cog and if both I and the alternate have to attend a Broomfield event that's related to governance, then we're being um, penalized for the fact that we're trying to do our job. So, um, I, you want me to go ahead. I, mean, I think I think we, we we recognize that. I mean. It happens all the time, but I think uh, when was it? A month or two ago, we voted on the times and how this would work. Uh, we did a, I think a doodle, if I recall correctly. And uh, are you saying that you both, you and your alternate, would both have a conflict? If it's a council meeting, yeah. yes. Well, the, it's, yeah, it, it can vary yeah. on different times, but there's always. The problem is, is certain activities that occur sometimes right, right. in the afternoon, and by the time we get here, we're going to be late. Yeah, and that, that could happen. Ahead. There's not a penalty. We, I don't think we're doing demerits on attendance yet. <laughs> no, just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, I don't think the intent was. It was trying to find every which way to, to okay. get your participation, um, understanding that it might not meet everyone's time, but there's, what, 56 uh, uh, jurisdictions involved. So. We're so could I make a suggestion? And I'm sorry to interrupt. The, the Governance Committee came up with the proposed guidelines for remote participation in the work session and for all committees. Mm -hmm. We haven't actually presented that. It's attached to the nominating committee. But since we haven't really focused on that, I would suggest we sever that piece of it because it applies to all of our committees. And, and, it in the and we can bring it up at the next board meeting because I don't know that it, we've shown the spotlight on that as, as brightly as we should. Okay. And, and uh, it's not specific to the nominating committee structure, which is, I, I think, what we're trying to vote on now. So if the um, motion could be, if we could uh, make a friendly amendment to. I accept. Okay. So <laughs> everybody understand the, the paragraph on remote participation will be brought back at the next board meeting for discussion. We won't have to meet again as the governance committee. That's Let's be clear. Okay. <laughs> well, and it, so anyway, I, I think we'll just bring it up at the next board meeting. So the motion on the table is to um, accept the recommended structure, member, membership structure of the nominating committee as proposed by the governance committee. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? One abstention. Director Rozier. Thank you all for that. So then, moving on, because we approved that structure, we can now look at the proposed articles. And um, Director Pfeiffer, I think you're going to cue that up. Sure. 
Um, so, so basically, we had one minor uh, correction or clarification that was uh, put in front of everyone as an individual sheet. Um, we've uh, adjusted all of the articles of association to reflect the structure approval we did last month. Um, and also, it does uh, reflect what we just approved as well. Um, the, the minor updates that I want to bring to your attention on the single sheet that was sitting on your desk when you sat down. Um, page 13, um, we wanted to clarify on B1 that when, when the nominating committee, one of the uh, rules we were setting there was it had to be a board member that was uh, involved with the board for at least a year. Um, we, we just need to clarify that that includes the alternate as well. We, we believe that there's alternates here that are very active participants and they should not be disqualified to be uh, selected as the nominating committee. Um, and then on the back side on page 14 on 2A5, um, the way that the structure was written was maybe not quite clear so when we typed up the association, it's really 10 new members. There's five on each of the new committees. There's five on the budget and finance committee and there's five new uh, or five uh, new on the um, performance and engagement that are for communities under 120,000 in population. So the, we increase it by 10 for the smaller communities in, in the two committees, five in each. Director Pfeiffer, there is one additional um, edit that the council just pointed out that when we make the change, if, assuming we do from five to 10, that on line 38, just below that, where it says nominate a sixth member, it should be nominate an additional member. Additional, okay. So sixth is replaced with additional. And thanks for people's indulgence with these edits. The governance committee didn't have a chance to review council's work before the board packet went out. So, Director Atchison, I saw your hand. Oh, sorry. I don't even. Uh, thought I was loud enough. Under member qualifications for nominating nominating committee, you change it. The shall not have served less than one year on the board as a member or an alternate. But number three down there, a designated alternate cannot serve on a nominating committee. Help me understand that. So just to That's clarify, you uh, would have have to been on the board either as a member or alternate. For one year. For one year. But to be on the nominating committee, you have to be the designated member at that time. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Does that make sense? That was a little confusing. We're just saying that if you've been an alternate. If you understand it, I'm Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good enough. So there are any questions about the proposed article changes or the, the new edits that Dr. And Director Pfeiffer just added? Mm -hmm. Director Holland. <coughs> We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. And I should add that we have counsel here if anybody has any legal questions about any of that. So any further discussion? And I just want to clarify that the motion is the amended version of the amendments. Okay. All right. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right. Good work. Now, because we have just adopted this new structure, we now need to create the new nominating committee. Point of clarification, did we vote on the edits or did we vote on the, the motion included including included the edits? Okay. Three edits? Thank you very much. So um, I just want to clarify the nominating committee that we are going to create tonight will serve from it, now until November when we create the new nominating committee. Typically, we do the nominating committee in, in November, and that, that, that nominating committee nominates the slate of board officers and new admin committee members. So we're just creating the new committees. So specifically, the nominating committee will take the existing admin board members, divide them up into the two committees, the Performance and Engagement Committee and the Budget and Finance, and we will canvas um, in mere moments, interest in the 10 individuals that will also get to serve on these new committees. The nominating committee will make recommendations on those new members and bring that back to the board. So is that clear? And under what we just passed, 
um, the nominating committee will automatically include Jackie Millay as our past chair. It will automatically include a representative from Denver. And um, I see that Robin is pointing to herself, so Robin can each. Yeah, by harmonious agreement with the administration, Chrissy, has, it, I'll take the turn this time. Okay. And so that leaves us four slots. So tonight, um, the board will elect three, and the chair will elect a fourth. So I would like to open the floor. I, I, I should say, the other tricky part about this is we uh, included just now qualifications that you would have had to serve for one year, either as an alternate or board. Just to clarify who's eligible, we put together that list. You see it on the, and it's blue in front of you. So John O'Brien is not eligible. We can't draft him to stay. So I would like to open um, the floor for nominations or shows which you can self-nominate, interest in serving on the nominating committee. We need at least three of you to volunteer and show interest. Director Stolzman? I'd like to nominate uh, Mayor Rakowski. He's not, he's not saying no. <laughs> Director Teal? Yeah. Seeing my name up on the board, I would like to place my own name in nomination. Okay. Director Partridge? I'll nominate Commissioner Holen. Director Holen. Holen. All right. Director Etchison. I was, but now I'm okay. What? Wait, I'm sorry. Just to, I'm going to, you've been nominated. Are you interested in serving? Sure. Until November, right? <laughs> it's in, it's still right. November. And I'm sorry, Colleen, were you nominating John or yourself? John. John. Oh, no, no, she nominate herself. <laughs> then I'll nominate Colleen. <laughs> there you okay. go. Okay. All right, wait, I see three more hands. Director Millay. I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. So for the benefit of the room, these individuals um, can also be in this pool to be officers next year because this won't be the committee selecting the officers for next year. So just make excellent sure people understand. clarification. So this is this is a, the short time nominating committee, relatively easy. I saw two more hands. Robin, sorry, yeah. Director Kanich. Yeah, I'd like to nominate um, Ashley Stoltzman from Louisville. Yes. And you? Okay. And did I see another hand up? Yeah. Okay. All right. We we're up to six names. Can you review For three them? positions. Can you review them again? Uh, how many? Uh, I'm sorry? Can you review the names again? Just yes. Yeah. We have Ron Murkowski, George Teal, Bill Holen, John Dyack, Colleen Whitlow, Ashley Stolzen. Okay. Is that Ron, uh, Ron Murkowski? We have six. It's hard because they're in city order instead of alphabetical order, so we're all struggling to find them. <laughs> He's going to highlight them on the screen, guys. You could go ahead and pass out. You did? You are so far ahead of me. Okay, so I just want to clarify, just see, are there any other nominations or shows of interest? Okay, move to close the nomination. Do we have a set? Second. All in favor of closing the nominations? Aye. Opposed? Okay, we're closing nominations. Everybody should have a small piece of paper. Yeah. Please put three names on it. Mm. No, no Preferably paper. from the nominated list. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would be funny. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> we're, in a, we're in an efficient row. We work 
together. <laughs> We're collaborative. Yes. I'm not getting. I'm still not BRC. Okay, so while Connie is counting the um, ballots, um, we'll move on to uh, the next item. You all have been very um, patient in tracking what we're doing tonight. So, I'm going to pass around these, these sheets. We're, uh, the two sets of people that should sign these are existing admin committee members. You should indicate a preference for which committee, either the Performance and Engagement Committee or the Budget Committee that you would like to serve on. And for anybody who is interested, who's not currently on the admin committee but wants to serve on one of those two committees, indicate your interest by signing up on, it. Um, yellow is for finance, pink is for performance. If you're interested in serving on w either one of them, then sign up on both sheets. This information will then go to the nominating committee who, who is, will be tasked with dividing up the existing admin committee members between the two committees and signing up 10 new members, five to each. So everybody get that? If you're interested in serving, and aren't currently on the committee, and if you are currently on admin, which committee you want to serve on? Any questions? So I'm going to start these around. We will also send out an email tomorrow in case your friends aren't at this meeting. <coughs> Madam Chair, there's a question in the back. Who has it? Sorry, but I thought, just for clarity, you have to have been on the board for a year for this No. Committee. No. no. Sorry, we're doing a different exercise. This is, um, so no, there's not that qualification. And, and we are looking forward to having a lot of people sign up with interest. The whole idea behind this new committee structure, one of many of the goals was to engage more board members in a more substantive way with Dr. Cog. go on to the next presentation. So why don't we, while we're waiting, they can continue counting, why don't we go on, move on to our informational briefing. Steve, can you um, talk to us about the Alternative Fuels Program? Sure. Let me just pull this <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Steve Cook, uh, MPO Planning Program Manager. There's no PowerPoint for this. I'm just going to lower these up. Um, this information item is attachment L uh, in your packet or page, actually noted page 136 of the, uh, the PDF file. Just going to give a really brief synopsis on this item. Uh, the subject of this information item uh, are the alternative fuel vehicle and station programs that are administered by two different agencies around this region. Um, they're administered by the Regional Air Quality Council, also known as the RAC, and also by the uh, Colorado Energy Office, or the CEO, a different CEO. Um, they administer two different programs. Uh, one of them is known as Alt Fuels Colorado. We'll talk about that in a second. And also Charge Ahead Colorado. Uh, the Alt Fuels Colorado program uh, was started with a $30 million uh, set aside uh, from CDOT, a statewide allocation for a four-year program from fiscal years 2014 through 2017. Um, its original focus was as a startup program to boost the use of compressed natural gas stations and vehicles across the entire state, you know, the vehicles with a focus on the uh, air quality non-attainment areas such as Dr. Cog's. Um, as we'll discuss in a minute, that program, the Alt Fuels program, has branched out also into electric vehicles and electric vehicle stations. So that's the first program. The second program is the Charge Ahead Colorado program, and that provides grants for both electric vehicles and for electric vehicle charging stations. Um, there are some derivations of the program as it's administered by uh, the RAC, the Regional Air Quality Council. Um, 
but it's been funded from Dr. Cog since 2003. So the Charge Ahead program, that's been around a while, and it's actually funded all the way through 2019. So last October, uh, two issues were brought up by uh, the Dr. Cog board, and staff was asked to come back with information related to two issues. Uh, the first issue was uh, about allowing transit vehicles to be eligible in the Alt Fuels Colorado program. So that was the first issue. And this was an important issue because we know that uh, RTD and other transit providers uh, in the area are very interested in expanding their electric vehicle fleets. Uh, after further review, no, not a football referee, but after further review, as noted in attachment one memo, which is from CDOT, um, they've concluded that transit vehicles will be eligible, uh, electric transit vehicles will be eligible in the upcoming call for applications. So that's good news there. Um, the second issue which we were asked to bring information back was the current rule within the Alt Fuels Colorado program. And that current rule, um, since that program is geared towards compressed natural gas stations, the rule is that, well, if you want to do an electric vehicle station and apply for that, it has to be co-located with a compressed uh, CNG uh, station. Um, we uh, note that that was actually via a Dr. Cog resolution in 2013 that requested that the co-location be, be allowed. Um, based on further analysis that we've done and others of the Charge Ahead Colorado program, which is very complementary to this other program, I know these programs get confused, uh, confusing here, um, staff believes that uh, applicants for electric vehicle charging stations and infrastructure are actually very well served by the Charge Ahead program um, that currently exists. Um, plus, the current Charge Ahead program um, funds installation costs as well as equipment, which the other program doesn't. So in conclusion, uh, it's uh, felt that the, the combined programs really provide significant and well-rounded funding uh, for both vehicles and station infrastructure uh, across the region. And we encourage uh, local governments to apply for funding for some of your fleet vehicles, school districts, and uh, work with and encourage private entities uh, in your areas um, to apply for stations, whether they be they electric or comp compressed natural gas or CNG. Um, in one example, the Southwest uh, Energy Efficiency Project just produced a report a couple days ago um, that is a handbook, not really a report, it's a handbook for how local governments can help do group purchases and things like that related to these types of uh, vehicles and stations. Uh, there's further information in the, in the memo. Uh, I checked with uh, the programs uh, earlier in the day to get some examples of some uh, key projects around the area just so you have those. But, and they mentioned that Aurora uh, has been uh, very, very, very active in terms of uh, electric vehicles. Boulder, Boulder Valley School District in terms of uh, installing stations. And for the CNG uh, vehicles, uh, City of Denver, uh, seven garbage trucks or refuge, refuse trucks, uh, and also the uh, Adams County School District uh, with some CNG vehicles. So it's across the region that this has been a benefit. So with that, are there any questions? And I see that our RAC representative had to leave. So. Questions for Steve? I just would make a comment that I feel like um, I appreciate that we asked for a report back on this because this is important. I feel like there's been a lot of cooperation lately that's yielding some positive results in figuring out exactly where to put fast charging electric vehicle stations and that that could be, uh, as I understand, there's a study that's looking at, in particular, it doesn't really work to co-locate with CNG, that you probably want to charge your electric vehicle while you're getting coffee at Starbucks. And so really retail establishments might work out better but I understand there's a study going on and that that might then help us guide where to focus future funding. But it's exciting and, and um, we just we're, we're sent an email today talking about how Colorado's bucked the trend on electric vehicles that instead of a decline like has been seen most places, we actually increased by 10%. So just another example of where we're in 
on the cutting edge. Director Vinham. For, forefront of uh, alternative <laughs> fuels and the, there's a, a faction in California that believes long-term electric vehicles and compressed natural gas vehicles will fade from the scene and the alternative fuel that will ultimately prevail is, is hydrogen and I notice on your proposal there's nothing for hydrogen do you have a comment on that uh, well, we yeah since since we, I really don't have a tech, technologically comment on that other than um, the RAC the Regional Air Quality Council and the uh, Colorado Energy Office these are what they're funding at the moment so I don't know if I could really opine and I don't know if Elise you're on you're on the rack if you have anything additional that you've heard through that group and there's a couple other people on the rack yeah that's um, a good question I don't know I bet we'd have we'll to get back to you on that. Yep. any final questions all right. Oh, director. Okay. Well, we're going to move on to the. Thank, thank you, you, Steve. Um, we're going to move on to committee reports. I'm going to not tell you the vote results until the committee reports, just so nobody leaves early. <laughs> but do you have? Huh? How about that? All right. I'll start with the first one um, on the stack. Um, the uh, Tiger notice of funding availability went out. There's an April 29th deadline. There's 500 million available for Tiger projects. Um, the Colorado contractors, as you might know, are still pursuing um, explore, exploration of a sales tax initiative. Um, they're going out into the field for a third time for polling, and they're having a meeting on Friday um, to, to give those results. So we should all be very um, focused and engaged on that. Um, the statewide transportation improvement plan is scheduled for an update. Um, stack staff will provide a draft next month or CDOT staff will provide a draft next month and it'll go out for public comment with adoption in July. And last but not least, a, a fascinating and scary stat, we got a report on traffic incident management. For every minute that a lane is closed, there's a 3% likelihood of a secondary crash, which means after a half hour, there's a 100% chance that there'll be another accident. And that's why it's important that we clear accidents quickly. And that's one of the things that CDOT uh, is focused on. That's all from Stack. Director Atchison. From Metro Mayors, we did have an executive committee <laughs> special meeting scheduled for um, about a week and a half ago to meet with <clears throat> to meet with the CCA to go over what their polling stuff was. However, CCA withdrew from the meeting the night before, so we did not hold the meeting. The next caucus meeting for CC for uh, Metro Mayors is in two weeks. Thank you, Director Rozier. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In regards to the Metro Area County Commissioners, um, CCA did show up to our meeting. Sorry. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. Um, so to Tony Milo gave us a presentation on um, the recent polling that they did and uh, some of the results there um, and the likelihood of voters, uh, depending on where they land on um, if they would support a mill levy increase or a sales tax increase and how much and when and where. So that was a, a good presentation. We also at that same meeting had a presentation by the uh, former uh, CDOT director Don Hunt and um, talking a little bit more about the mobility choice process and the mobility choice blueprint process I should say. Um, and uh, working with um, CDOT, RTD, um, looking, he's looking for um, our support from here. Dr. Cog, we've heard him in the past present, and uh, so he took a lot of our questions and, and comments and uh, moved forward. So sounds like an exciting process he's going through. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rozier. Um, Jayla, did you want to report on the AAA? Good evening. Um, we had a presentation from the Talking Books Library. They're expanding some of their servi or services, so that's a really good resources for uh, people who are low vision and vision impaired. Um, we also had a presentation by Gary Sobel. He is a, 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 a Parkinson's network, um, and he's developed this amazing exercise program for people with Parkinson's. He has Parkinson's himself. He was in a wheelchair and has worked his way up to uh, being able-bodied and leading exercise uh, groups all across the region and um, he was he's super inspiring 
Um, we also had Matthew Helfant from here, at Dr. Cog in the Transportation Division, come and talk about the Dr. Cog Coordinated Transit Plan and get some input from our advisory committee members about the plan. Boy, oh boy, did they come to life. Uh, uh, life. Uh, they had lots of comments. Um, so some of those are, uh, you know, the concern that when transit opens, we lose local bus routes and we also lose accessor rides. So those goes away and, and it limits transportation options for seniors. There was a lot of conversation about accessor ride and, and regular bus transit lines. Um, they're linked and they need to not be linked. There was concern about how much accessor ride costs consumers as well as the system and that there might be a more effective way to deliver services to people and less costly. Um, there was a lot of talk about looking beyond RTT for transportation uh, solutions. Uh, there was talk about call a ride and how limited the services were, um, particularly in the morning uh, and didn't work for early morning you know, doctor's appointments and things like that. That RTD areas don't cover a lot of our region, Broomfield in particular and Douglas County. Uh, so a lot of, you know, what can we do beyond those? We need to look for different kinds of solutions. There was talk about moving beyond just for, for funding like ours because we fund transportation in the Area Agency on Aging, but we focus on medical trips and nutrition trips. And there was encouragement that we need to look beyond that because about <coughs> one in six people over 65 in Colorado don't drive. And what do you do when you can't drive? What do you do for men outlive their driving years for seven years, women for 10 years? What do you do in that time if you can't drive? So there was encouraging, they were encouraging us to, we need to coordinate those funding services, those funding source, um, the funding so that we can use RTD money and veterans money and AAA money and Medicaid money to get people where they want to go when they want to get there. We need to look at new alternatives uh, for transportation we need to continue to support volunteer driver programs, look at Uber and Lyft options, and then uh, look at how to expand existing services and, and, and work collaboratively. So it was a very, very good discussion um, with a lot of passion and a lot of stories of uh, how the system has failed people. Thanks, Jayla. Sure. Um, I think Jennifer's going to give the RAC update. Yeah, the RAC met on March 4th. Uh, we um, did a review of the progress of drafting a new state implementation plan. There were presentations on uh, mission inventories, the inspection and maintenance program, and new sources. And then there were various subcommittees that reported out, including the station area and area sources committee, the mobile sources committee, and the Transportation and Land Use and Pricing Committee reported out. Great. Director Rakowski? Uh, the uh, last Thursday's meeting was canceled. The previous meeting, uh, the most important thing was Parker is taking over the world. Josh Martin is now the chair of E470. Go, Josh. Wow. Hey, Josh. Good to know. All right. Bill, if you want to bring it home on Fast Tracks. Sure. The RTD Fast Tracks Monitoring Committee t took three actions which will be taken to the full board later this month. In the interest of time, I will deem those not of interest to this group. If you want to hear about them, you'll be bored. Um, so I won't say anything more about those three actions. They're publicly available if you're really dying to hear, but they really aren't. Thanks. Importantly, We're not dying. Things. So, so the only other thing I have to report is what we, what I think virtually everyone around this table knows, and that is just to reiterate that the University of Colorado A-line opening 
between Denver Union Station and DIA has scheduled the ribbon cuttings on Friday, April 22nd, the grand opening ceremony and celebration also on Friday, April 22nd, and station parties and art dedications on the next day, Saturday, April 23rd. So hold those dates on your calendar. The information's out there. If you need more information, feel free to contact me, and I'll get it to you. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, Director Roth. I just wanted one quick comment for the newcomers. Uh, just the reason for the mic is so that you're on the record, just so you know. And so we can hear you. <laughs> it's true. Jackie doesn't need hers, but the... No. no. Ooh. Uh, all right. So... Um, I'm going to announce the results of the nominating committee vote. Um, the board gets to choose three. The chair gets to nominate one. So I'm just going to take the top four vote getters. It was a very close vote and in no particular order. Um, our new nominating committee members are Director Rakowski, Director Stolzman, Director Dyack, and Director Whitlow. So congratulations. So thanks, everybody, for working through a really full agenda. We are adjourned. <laughs>